and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. Do 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 <laughs> Yes, this is the final week of our look through Veil vale of the Void. Because while we technically covered the last of the core book when we, d when we talked about the GM guide, there's still some unfinished matters that we have to attend to. Things that cropped up that we couldn't fit in in the, in the regular episodes. So that's what we've got here. A grab bag along with our final thoughts on Veil of the Void. Indeed. Oh. And just because it's the finale of, the, of this part of it doesn't mean that we're going to be done with Veil of the Void because I know that there's that um, Norse-inspired project that, he, that he's working on, which I jokingly called Too Human Without the Suck. <laughs> although, although saying although saying that you're doing a better job at at Norse sci-fi than two human, that's not exactly narrowing it down. But that's that's, um, that's low bar. Low bar, yes. Um, that bar is so that bar is so low that even a contortionist couldn't limbo under that. That bar is so low that magma is higher than it is. Mm -hmm. But for this grab bag, we're going to be covering three items. The Etemret species, the Blade Dancer class, or which um <laughs> which amusingly it, on the on the tab version calls it Spellblade. <laughs> Although to be fair, he did tell me that that we'd get a kick out of the out of this class because of our um, take on Gish characters. Oh boy! And lastly, a a micro expansion that would pro that um that I that f I feel we're covering way out of season called Nightfall, and you'll see why in a minute. So let's get right into it and start with the Etemret. This was a species that was that was introduced after Reforged had come out, but I couldn't. But I didn't feel right introducing it when we did the species chapter. So, and remind me when we did when we did the species, did we do did we cover the text blurb? I don't think we did. Uh, we we didn't uh, because we had a lot of species to get through. Mm -hmm. But I think with the Edimret, uh, we might need to. I'll at least let, a little I'll bit. I'll let you lead that in. Alrighty then. Well then, my good friends. <clears throat> At the beginning here, we have a little quote from the Elder Prophecy. They shall fill the skies of the night, consuming the stars themselves. They shall fall upon the galaxy as an endless blizzard. With their arrival, the roots shall wither and the nights will seem endless. This shall be the first sign that signifies the end. I really was right. They are the Tyranids and the Zerg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> this, is, this is the beginning of the Etimret. I don't know if any of you have caught that joke yet. The Endless Swarm. Etimret are a strange one. They are an aggressive species of large humanoid bugs. Each one is capable of telepathic communication with the others and are a powerful source of supersensory effects. Their group has an endless hunger, driven by a voice from beyond the veil known only as the One Who Consumes. The One instills this hunger in them at spawning, creating what is known as the Prime Directive. Ha. This species is one of the few capable of directly interacting with the realm roots, often consuming bits of it, disrupting the travel of the Celestia and Topican. 
Etimrit are a semi-hive mind swarm broken down into various legions. Each legion consists of drones, workers, fighters, swarm doctors, and captains. Captains are the central hive mind, each one ruling their legion with an iron fist. Legions are bound to a captain, but are never fully under their control. Should the captain fail their job, they may be killed, repurposed within creation pools, then replaced with a new captain. Swarm Doctors are the second command. They oversee healing and maintaining all other units within their legion, taking on the role of both medic and engineer. They are ruthless to ally and enemies alike. Swarm Doctors are the first to tear apart and repurpose a captain that has failed to uphold the Prime Directive. Each doctor maintains a direct connection to the voice of the one who consumes. Oh, so they're homunculi. Something like that. <laughs> Just sounds more like Tyranids to me. Mm -hmm. Fighters are the front assault force of the Etimret swarms, often the first aboard enemy vessels during raids. They have a heavy carapace and are armed with powerful bioweapons. Fighters revel in the bloodshed and happily defend their colony against foolish adventurers. Workers are the backbone of the colony, and the lowest of the non-drone swarm rankings. They are many, however, and can overthrow a captain deemed unworthy. They are often multi-armed and rather sturdy creatures. Drones are the mindless swarms created for one purpose, servitude. They have no will of their own, and are of little intelligence, and have short lifespans. Drones are designed to be the perfect expendable working unit. I can see where you get the I can see where you get the NID comparison. Then we have, the whole thing screams nids. Mm -hmm. Then we have Rebel Legions. Not all legions are part of the overall swarm. Some break off to be their own masters. These legions serve no one and are unpredictable. Some of them are notorious pirate groups, others soldiers and mercenaries for hire. To the greater swarm, however, these rebels are considered traitors best killed on sight. Then, of course, we have the Prime Directive. Edomet are driven by a strong urge to consume the Realm Roots. It's part of their core. It's not known why this desire is so prevalent in their lives, but it is always at the forefront of their minds. Even the Rebel Legions admit to still hearing this directive. The Drive tells them to consume all things, with a focus on the Realm Roots. The damage they cause to the Roots when left unchallenged is immeasurable. The other thing I'm kind of reminded of when they talk about the one who consumes is the Great Maw. Uh, specifically, the maw, the maw that that is worshipped by the ogres in in Warhammer Fantasy. Yeah, it's not a one to one comparison, but I can see some aspects. Let's see. Then we have a living armada. The Etimret are the scourge of the stars, pirates that chase, steal, and destroy all that they can. Most of their units are armed in a carapace supplying a strong defense against incoming attacks. Their ships are even more terrifying, however. Each vessel is a massive, living creature. It produces its own breathable atmosphere and even allows for intergalactic travel. These ships have several pores on their sides that shoot acidic cannonballs at targets, and organic sails that allow them to rapidly approach enemy vessels. The ship is armed with a large mouth with several rows of rotating teeth that bite down on enemy starships, tearing them apart. After ripping into the enemy vessel, a powerful biomechanical toxin floods the victim's ship, shutting down all inner defense systems and engine drives. The Edomret boarding party all will then swarm the ship, looting, killing, consuming, and leaving it a husk of its former self. So chomp chomp. Make your make your uh, ships have a, a shield made of raid, guys. Mm-hmm. Etimret style raid. Kills space roaches. Dead. <laughs> so then we get to the stats. They can live to be forty age, they can live to be forty years old and have three age cycles. Hatched from birth to one year, larva from one to five, and adult from five to forty. 
height. Their builds vary, and their height can be from 3 to 7 feet. Speed, 6 squares. Then they have Voice of the Swarm. You have a difficult time speaking the common language, often interrupting sentences with harsh clicks and, per and peculiar head turns. You speak common and chiraka, speech of the swarm. Then we have traits. First is acidic bite. This potent oh, acidic bile. bile. It's, it's acidic bile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This potent acidic bile is stored in the toxin glands. You may freely use this bile to melt simple metal slash items. This affects a single square if used on a larger item or wall. This may be used three times per short rest. Oh, now they're space marines. <clears throat> the Betcher's gland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's arcane weakness. Edimret have a general weakness to magic. Roll with three auto miss dice on incoming contested arcanting and dodge checks when attempting to dodge, negate, and resist spells. Oh, well, uh, there you go. If you're ever facing the swarm, get your mages, people. Mm -hmm. Prime Directive. All Edimret are hatched with the Prime Directive of consuming the realm roots, regardless of alliance. They receive an urge to consume at any chance they can. If you consume parts of the realm roots at your location... You gain plus 10% max HP for one week. If you resist the Prime Directive for more than one week, you will instead lose 10% of your max HP until you consume the Realm Roots. The Realm Roots are found and grown where forests, are found where, where forests grow and inside Topakin. Consuming the Realm Roots can, kills all plant life within a 25-foot circle around you. Let's see, then we have Star Raiders. The Edimret are fierce raiders, often preying on the starships of unsuspecting mortals. When raiding a ship, gain plus one bonus die on checks made within the prey's vessel. Fair point. Then we have Swarm Psyche. Edimret are a species of powerful supersensory beings. At the start of character creation, you gain the supersensory expertise and may communicate telepathically with other Edimret within a five-mile radius. Additionally, choose two abilities from the super, super sensory list. Yep. And you've got it right there. Mm -hmm. And I believe we went through these when we went when we went over super sensory. Um might have. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that was actually in Super Sensory. In fact I'm pretty sure Super Sensory just says come up uh come up with something with your GM as a super sensory power. Let me check the core book. Yeah, super sensory, two points unique. You are a being of super sensory abilities. Work closely with your GM to create some simple but special super sensory strength. Example, ability to sense those, the super sensory gifts in a small range, ability to see slightly into the future, telepathy, etc. Mm -hmm. So this list is actually unique to the, the Edim rep for their Psyche stuff. All right. So first we have Psyche Repel. Once per no, long... first we have Mind Strike. Oh, my, sorry, Mind Strike. Target a creature within seven squares and perform a contested mentality check. On a success, inflict 2d6 pure damage. Mm-hmm. This damage increases by 1d6 every 5th level, 2 round cooldown. Wow, that's uh, that's 66 pure damage at level 20. Mm -hmm. Wow. Let's see, then we have Psych Repel. Once per long rest as a reaction, summon a shield of super sensory energy around you for 2 rounds. You may automatically repel melee attacks from creatures with a mentality... Ver Virtue total less than yours. Ah, then we have Mental Jaunt. You may teleport up to two times mentality squares away from your current position. If you move through or out of a threatened area, the target may attempt an attack against you with minus two bonus die. Two round cooldown. Then is Cerebral Superiority. When performing contested mentality checks, roll with plus one bonus die. Then Mind Feast. When a creature fails a contested mentality check against you, you attack their mind 
and steal up to your mentality and hit points from them healing your HP. If I were going to make an Edom Ret, I would probably choose Mind Strike and Cerebral Superiority just to make sure my Mind Strikes do you hit. Mm -hmm. Let's see, and then we have Swarm Paths, and you ha and you ha you can only choose one. First is the Swarm. All Edom Ret well, remember. I think this is actually just something you get. Period. Yep. And then the, and then the Swarm Paths are below that. All members are edit are all Adam Red are members of the swarm and gain plus one virtue point in the virtue of their choice. Then we have workers. Workers make up the most of the swarm. You start the game with four to six arms, allowing you to equip up to six weapon arms and tools, granting an extra action to use in combat. If you do not want to start the with the extra arms, you instead gain plus two max determination and plus two bonus levels and two skills. So you can forego extra the extra arms, start with four, and get plus two max determination and plus two levels and in, in plus two bonus levels and two skills. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's pretty nice. But of course, if you go to six, you can now you can now wield three great weapons instead of two. <laughs> Let's see. Then we have the fighters. The defenders of the swarm armada and the hunters of prey. You get a carapace armor of heavy four and a bio pistol that does 1d6 acidic damage that has a rate of 816 and uses your primary virtue to attack. It does not require ammo as long as you're the one using it. The damage increases by 1d6 for every fifth level. At level 10, it becomes a rifle increasing in range from 20, from 20 to 40 and gaining sustained fire. Sustained Acidic Fire. Wow. Mm -hmm. See, then we have Swarm Doctor. Swarm Doctors play a vital role in the Swarm, typo, keeping both organic and machine running. Start with plus one bonus level in Medicament. As an action, target an organic or mechanical ally within 15 squares and perform an average three Medicament check. On a success, heal that target by 2d6 plus mentality hit points. If used on an allied emirate, heal them by half their max. <laughs> Let's see, then we have Captain. The highest ranking leader within the swarm. They lead their legions to victory and raid the galaxy of its resources. Gain the leadership expertise. Once every minute, the captain may freely give an ally plus one bonus die on their next skill. Captains start with a drone NPC recreated using the NPC guide in the core rulebook. And as a uh, reminder to anyone who doesn't remember the expertises from a few ep episodes ago, leadership, whether you lead through inspirational speeches, commanding force, or brilliant intellect, People follow you. You also tend to inspire greatness in others. When assisting a group check, you may allow a single player to turn a 1 or 2 result to a 5 result. During combat, you may grant 1 player plus 1 pip to spend on checks once per round. Mm -hmm. So as far as the Edomret goes, I think the only thing that might be a bit tricky is is, is for some people justifying why an Emirate is, part, is in the party. Um... Well, the justification is going to be the uh, rebel, the rebel factions, mm -hmm. and maybe it's a rebel faction whose uh, whose uh, captain has been killed, so they're they've gone on to sort of a diaspora. There's multiple ways I can see of justifying an Edomret. Um, we can also see that the Edomret traits, the the different traits, are definitely suited towards specific classes, like. If you're going to have a soldier, you're definitely going to choose a fighter. Mm -hmm. And you might even take some of the sniper based some of the sniper based pathing in fighter just for that. Mm -hmm. Cuz you know, you get that rifle. Um and of course, something like the uh the captain is probably going to be it's going to be your face man almost it seems. And so you might choose him to be the negotiator mm -hmm. or uh, the workers are going to be people like your smugglers. 
there's there's definitely a synergy, a class synergy going on with each swarm uh, type, but I don't think they're limited to that. It's just that's probably what's going to be most useful. Mm -hmm. So next we come to uh, we come to a class that we did that we didn't cover initially because, well, this thing came out. This thing came out. I had this in PDF form for a while, but it was still in the testing phase, so I sat on it. Until about two and a half weeks ago. Yep, but we were already finished with classes and moving towards the end of this, so we decided to add it to the grab bag. Mm -hmm. That being the Blade Dancer. I like the art already. Oh, yeah. Oh. Of course, we've said, we've said that with a lot of the art. The art's been really good. That's a, a, So... We'll get to this in more detail later, but holy shit, the art. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to leave it at that. Holy shit, the art. Yeah. Rumors of the Blade Dancers have been sung throughout history. They are elegant fighters on the battlefield who strike at foes with a graceful fury. They carry with them the secrets of the art of quickly and effortlessly dancing between opponents. Their elegance is unmatched and their technique unrivaled. Through the usage of their Blade Tech gauntlets... They can access and manipulate a pocket dimension that rests within their very being. This allows them to store, bind, and call forth powerful weapons. This device has helped speed up the process of blade dancing, perfecting it in the finest, to the finest field of arts. Each blade is an extension of its wielder. These blades are precious, each one a beautiful melody that plays with each swing. Eat every slice, every swipe, all of it makes one beautiful dance. It's a difficult path to master, but once one learns to follow the symphony created by their blades, they can do anything. They're truly a sight to behold, and a force to be feared in battle. I'm not going to make an elf joke, I'm not going to make an elf joke. Why Why would you need to resist making an elf joke? The, the art that we see here look both like prototypes. It mostly has to do with the the, the description. And reminds I mean, me way too much of the um, Swordmasters of Hoeth. Or the original Blade Dancers being elf exclusive. Yeah. Either, either way, the... Either way, let's see let's see what else we got here. So leveling beyond level one. At each level up you add one D six or three plus one D three or one plus vitality to your max HP. Nice. Mm -hmm. So normal you know normally seen for slightly higher combat classes. Mm -hmm. let's see, starting proficiency. Weapons, all one-handed and two-handed blades from the Reforged Core rulebook. Um, there's a small part of me that would, that might that might house rule it that they can that they can have any um, one or two-handed melee weapon. And if it sounds like I want a bl a blade dancer who doesn't use a blade but actually uses a, actually uses a Morning Star, that's because I do. <laughs> Or if it sounds like he wants a uh, blade dancer that doesn't use a blade but uses a fucking halberd, that's because he does. Yes. Because I like halberds. At least you don't say them like Asmongold does. Halibard. <laughs> True. Let's see. Medium synthetic armor for their armor proficiency and... Blade Tech Gauntlet for their tool proficiency. And for starting items, you have two one-handed melee weapons, one two-handed non-great melee weapon, synthetic medium armor, Blade Tech Gauntlet, nimble expertise, plus one bonus level in balance and weapon master, and 46 times a thousand credits. That's quite a few starting items. Mm-hmm. Let's see, then we get to our abilities proper, starting at level 1. First is Bound by Blades, which is exclusive. This class cannot use ranged weapons, 
Blades are any melee weapon that inflicts piercing, slashing, or plasma damage. Ah, okay, so there you go. They have to have piercing, slashing, or plasma. Mm -hmm. Which still means you could have a halberd blade dancer. Yeah. Then the blade. The dancer's weapons are extensions of their own soul. They use they use blade tech gauntlets to store them within a pocket dimension. At creation, choose three melee weapons you have and bind them to your gauntlet. These weapons become bound blades. During a short rest of at least two hours, you may focus on a proficient blade and bind it to bind it and add it to your gauntlet. Bound blades cannot be lost or destroyed. Though if you lose your gauntlet, you will have to craft a new one. If you attempt to summon a bound blade without the gauntlet, it takes two rounds of channeling. A blade dancer may have six blades under control at one time. These blades may not be cute two-handed weapons with the keyword great. That reminds me of um one of the specializations that a uh, soldier had with the gauntlet that caused you to switch it, or the multi-weapon. Mm -hmm. I think it was a soldier that had it. Yeah, it was soldier. Let's see, then we have the dance. Which it is was the adapt tech. Yep. I think. Mm -hmm. Battle is an art as any other. After you perform a successful attack action with a single bound blade, you may choose another target within two times base movement and teleport to them, ignoring reactionary strikes, performing an attack with a different bound blade. This attack may not be a dual-wielding attack. Blades may be summoned and equipped for free during this attack. If the attack fails, the blade goes into cooldown for three rounds. If there is only one target, you may use this action against them without needing to teleport once every two rounds. And I'd like to note that all of these level 1 abilities are uh, are exclusives. Mm -hmm. So at level 2, you gain Elegance on the field, which is also exclusive. While wielding a Bound Blade, gain plus 1 auto-hit die on Deflects. And you get next. And since it's an even level, you get an extra skill point. At level three, we have our first non-exclusive feature. I don't count extra skill point, obviously. Called Flash of Steel. When you deflect an attack, you may send energy through your blade, inflicting the blind condition on your attacker for one round, three round cooldown. You may use balance to deflect. Very cool. See, at level 4, you get Advancement Training and Chasse. 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 It's, I'm, it's either going to be Italian or French. I'm pretty sure that one's French. Yeah. Once every three rounds after you perform the dance's second attack, you may attack a third target as an extra action. This could be a previously hit adversary. <laughs> I see why they called it Chasse. Mm-hmm. At fifth level, you get your you get your first feature in your specialization. At sixth level, you gain bound crafting, which is an exclusive. If a blade is bound during a long rest of at least six hours, you may perform a hard four crafting check on it. On success, the blade is bound to you and gains an augmentation slot. Nice. You also gain Harmony Promenade, which is a non-exclusive. While equipped with a one-handed blade, gain plus one bonus level in balance. While equipped with a two-handed blade, gain plus two bonus levels in muscle. See, and then we have Advancement Training at level seven. At level eight, you gain a certain eloquence. Gain plus one bonus level in speechcraft. Roll with an auto-hit die on intimidation checks when threatening with a proficient weapon. And that's non-exclusive. Mm -hmm. And we have... And Roske. And, and Roske Rhythm. Once per round, upon succeeding a dodge check, you may activate the dance ability against your attacker for free. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then we get Torrent. Yep. Torrent, which is non-exclusive, gain plus one bonus level in dodge, and you may re-roll a one result on your next check after a successful dodge. Three-round cooldown. 
Then at 10th level, you gain your next point of specialization. At 11th, you gain advancement training. At 12th, you gain Tempo Allegro. Gain an additional reaction to use on deflects and increase your base movement speed by two squares. Flash of Steel may activate twice in the same round. <laughs> I see where this is going. At 13th level, you gain Brise. Yep. Leap to a spot up to twice your base movement away from your current position. This allows you to climb up walls or jump over large gaps. Two round cooldown. At 14th level, you gain advancement training. At 15th level, you gain specialization. And as an aside, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, but Brise is non exclusive. Mm -hmm. At 16th level, you gain Artery Dodge, which is non exclusive. No, nope. nope. Arrière Dodge. Uh, Excuse arrière. me. Yeah. Uh, and it is non exclusive, mm -hmm. yes. After a successful deflect, you may teleport behind the target and perform an attack. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing personnel, kid. God fucking damn it. It follows us everywhere, monk. We can't escape it. Well, I mean he is the uh the best fighter in the Sonic Battle Academy. <sighs> if this attack hits, inflict plus ten additional damage, three round cooldown. At 17th level, you gain advancement training. At 18th level, you gain, I think, dégage? De dégage. Dégage. That's why it has to accent mm -hmm. you. Once per round, when taking over 20 damage from a single attack, you may perform the disengaged movement ability for free and gain 5 energy shield points for 3 rounds. And Ow, you hit me, and now I have a shield, and fuck you, you can't hit me anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's non-exclusive. Uh -uh. Then we have two 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 uh, terms that are very, very familiar to literally anyone who has talked about fighting ever. ever. Mm -hmm. First is parry and riposte, which is a non-exclusive. Upon a successful deflect, you may inflict the stun condition on your attack. If the attacker was already inflicted with the stun condition, you inflict two times weapon damage on the target instead. This stun may proc twice per target per day. A parry and riposte are the terms I was talking about. Everybody knows what a parry and a riposte are. Yep. Especially anybody playing a Souls game because you're probably relying on, be on it quite a bit. Or if you're playing Elden Ring where they built in a riposte system. Mm-hmm. Let's see, then we have 20th level, which gives you your final ability from your specialization, as well as your ultimate, Mastery of the Dance, which is exclusive, obviously. You have refined and perfected the art of the dance. Add plus one to finesse, this may bring you up to nine points. The dance ability now has a range of three times base movement, and if the attack fails, it no longer goes on cooldown. Your bound blades now inflict plus 1d6 damage, and you may have 9 blades under your control at once. Why does this just sound like I'm turning into Virgil? <laughs> Am I wrong? No. Are you motivated? Aren't you motivated? Where's your determination? Foolishness, Dante, foolishness. <laughs> there is your answer. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to the subclasses for the Blade Dancer. The first is Art of Precision. Non-exclusive. Mm -hmm. In fact, if in fact everything no. within the everything within it is non-exclusive. Yes, but the specialization itself is also non-exclusive. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to make... Um, hold on a second. Uh... Okay. Um, there is a typo. 
all the way back in the level five where it shows the three arts you can get um there is not a an exclusivity mark for the third one because if you look further in the in the document the third one is or is the third one yeah the third one is uh exclusive as well so just want to let, let uh let them know about that because it it they're both there's two exclusive uh specializations and and one non-exclusive mm -hmm. so first first we have the art of precision the practitioners of precision understand the most finite details of the art they have a supernatural ability to direct their movements to the most specific of orders so we start with perfectly time this specialization grants class points known as timing points they start with 6 points and gain 3 additional points at 10, 15, and 20th level. Regain half of the expended points during a short rest and full points during a long rest. Timing points may be spent on the list below. So for 3 points you can activate critical timing, inflict a critical hit on a successful attack. Confirmed for, crit? <laughs> for 1 point, swift strike, add an auto hit die onto a successful attack check. Uh, for four points... No, on, on, no, on a failed mm -hmm. attack check. Yeah, failed. Why would you add an auto-hit die on something that was successful? Mm -hmm. Fair like, this is this is This is where you know you only need one more hit to actually hit. So you're mm -hmm. just like, so strike, we'll spend one point, here's an auto-hit die, now I have enough to succeed. Yep. Very cool. Um, precise counter, which is four points, during a successful deflect... You may perform an attack against the target. On successful hit, roll on the critical table. So, um, so I, I, I have a perfect phrase for this, monk. <clears throat> <Wolf counter! laughs> for Then we have perfect balance, which costs one point. On a failed balance check, add plus two auto hit die to the check. Can bring you above two auto hit die to a max of four. That's and, um Go ahead. Having two different hey, add some auto hit dice if you failed this check things is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Then lastly we have perfect reflexes, which is four points. During a failed dodge check, add plus three auto hit dice to the check. And with all of with all of them there. There isn't any talk of cooldowns. Yeah, you just spend a point and use them. Mm -hmm. Sorry. There's probably a lack of cooldowns due to the fact that you're using an additional resource. Mm -hmm. So at 10th level, you gain targeted feint. Twice per short rest, when you fail or critically fail an attack, you may reroll all one results. What? I'm just going to reroll all my ones. Really? Yeah. Oh, look. There's a bunch of fives and sixes. I guess I didn't miss after all. Mm -hmm. Uh. So then we get to level fifteen, clear cut. I remember that guy. I remember that guy when I was reading X. When I was reading X Force. Eh. Once every two rounds, when performing skill checks with a skill that has four plus points, or with an item or weapon you are proficient with, you may re-roll the check for free, even if it was previously re-rolled. So you get another second chance. Mm-hmm. Fair. Then perfect strike, the level tw the level twenty benefit. Twice per combat, target an adversary within three times base movement and teleport to them, performing an attack that automatically hits, deals pure damage, and inflicts a critical success plus one. 
if only we weren't playing into cold steel <laughs> is this just more cold steel i was gonna i was gonna a i was gonna ask if he what if um if he has a crane clan deck eh? let's see then we have art of distance our first of two exclusive subclasses on rare occasions, a Blade Dancer will overpower their soul's limitations. This allows them to bind ranged weapons to their tech gauntlets. So first does, we ha- Go ahead. Does this mean I can do Gunstinger? Um, Am I turning into Dante now? Let's find out. First is the gun. The gun is good. The penis is bad. Gain access to ranged weapons. Ranged weapons may be affected by both the blade and the dance abilities. Instead of teleporting to a target during the dance, you may instead teleport up to two times your base movement away from your target. You may store four guns at one time. So... What you're telling me is I have swords and I have guns. Or I should say I have blades and I have guns. Mm -hmm. Do I have an electric guitar that's also literally an axe? <laughs> Can it throw around lightning bats? Can I seduce it? <laughs> anyway, next is Counter-Strike at level 10. We're not playing CSGO. No, because we actually like fun. <laughs> When an adversary moves to attack you, you may perform an attack using your ranged weapon as a reaction, inflicting plus five pure damage on a successful hit. This is the Dio and Jojo meme, except Dio just shot Jojo as he was walking forward. Mm -hmm. Then we have Ever Watchful. Gain a five by five ranged threatened area centered on you. Once every three rounds, if an adversary moves through this area... You may perform a reactionary strike using your ranged weapon for free. Why am I getting equilibrium vibes? I can't imagine why. Let's see. Then at 15th level, you gain balanced parry. You may use your ranged weapon on a parry. On a successful repel, you may, success you may perform an average 3 balance check. If you succeed, perform a free attack using your ranged weapon. And lastly, feigned retreat. Twice per combat, when hit by an attack, you may teleport up to three times base movement away from your target and attack all targets within the long range of your weapon. This is John Preston! No, monk. It's worse. Max it's Payne. Jesus. It's Jesus Yamato. <laughs> Teleports three three base movement away and then hits everyone in the range of his long range weapons. Fuck, you're right. It's laser spam Yamato, everybody. Go get in your freedom and shoot them. You're not wrong. And then we have the third um, subclass, Art of the Spellblade. The practitioners of the Art of the Spellblade are naturally gifted with the manipulation of the arcane current. They enchant their blades with archaic runes. This grants them access to the current itself. Through study, they have gained a new form of magic tailored to their attacks. First, Arcanting. Your primary casting virtue is finesse. Immediately learn all spells from the swordplay spell tree. Gain four novice spells and one apprentice spell from any non-unique spell tree. You gain plus one spell at every fifth level. Non-swordplay spells are treated as standard spells with charge states. So then, then we add the spell. Gain the spellblade expertise. After you hit a target with a non-area spell, 
you may hit another target within range with the same spell at novice level. This may be used twice per rest. Encore! 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 <laughs> Then we ha and we all and the third that we get at level five is engraved arcane. Spell blades are the eldest specialization for blade dancers. Since the bound blades were first crafted, magic has always been atta attracted to them. You may inscribe a different spell of your current spell level onto each individual blade during a long rest. Once per round, a spell on one of your bound blades may be activated for free after landing a successful attack or as a standard action on your turn. Each spell has one charge. All spell difficulties are treated as an arcanting attack. So you basically gain the spell blade specialization or expertise and then some. Mhm. Mm nice. See, then we get counter slice. When a non-area field spell is successfully used against you, you may perform a contested arcanting check. On a success, your blade consumes the arcane energy, negating the spell's effects. After this, you may refill up to two spells, two spells for your blades, enchanted by engraved arcane or spell blade. You may activate this ability twice per short rest. So, Celes. Um, yeah, I would have to say that that's runic, through and through. Mm -hmm. At level 15, you gain Arcane Empowerment. While you have an active spell in either your Bound Blade through the Spell Blade Expertise or the Ingrained Ar Arcane ability, the blade inflicts an additional 1d6 elemental damage. But what if the spell engraved is not elemental? What then? That's my question. Because it doesn't look like the uh, the um, swordplay the swordplay magic has elements. Yeah. Then we have focused practice. During a short rest of at least an hour, you may focus on a known spell realm and reduce that charge state by half. Oh hey. Which, that's certainly going to be useful. And at level 20, you gain Blade Manifestation. Choose a single bound blade. This blade becomes your Manifestation Blade. This blade hovers next to you and is considered unbreakable and ethereal. While active, this blade gives you an additional reaction. As a standard reaction, you may activate this blade to attack a target within 2d2 times base movement of you. If the attack succeeds, the blade may perform the dance ability. So, okay, okay. If the basic class is mostly Virgil, Spellblade is the finishing touches of Virgil. Magic and swords. Swords and magic. No guns. Mm -hmm. And we haven't even gotten to the swordplay magic itself. This is true. Swordplay magic is a very powerful magic that only the Spellblades have access to. You may only cast as many of these spells as you have blades in your tech gauntlet, max of seven spells. These spells reset every short rest and have no charge stance. If you lose your tech gauntlet or are wielding a sword unaffected by the engraved arcane or spell blade, you cannot cast sword play spells. You do not need to have a specific blade equipped to cast a specific spell. You just need one equipped equipped with sorry, not not equipped, enchanted with engraved arcane or spell blade. You gain all these spells. These spells do not count as novice, apprentice, adept, magus, superlative, or mystic spells. It is important to note that while these spell plays do not have the spell level, they may improve at levels 5, 10, 15, and 20. All right. <clears throat> I, I, I kind of want to read the spells because I want to give them the, the gravitas they deserve, monk. All right. right. Let's start with Allegro. Okay. Allegro. Movement to a blade dancer is key. It's a difficulty of average three. The range is self. The duration is instant for three rounds. And the cooldown is four rounds. 
after a successful cast, gain plus one base movement speed and plus one bonus die on non-attack finesse-based checks. At level 15, the movement speed goes to plus two instead of plus one. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be honest, this second spell is the only reason I wanted to read them all. <laughs> and that spell is Coupé Après. Yes, I did take French in school. Yes, my, my accent is still terrible. But hey. An explosive end to our dance. Difficulty is a contested arcanting check. The range is melee, uh, and, and either goes to a two, three, four, or five foot square cone. The duration is for the duration of a deflect reaction. Uh, okay. So you actually have to deflect and re react. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And cooldown is four rounds. You may activate this ability as a deflect reaction. Upon successful cast, deflect an adversary's attack and slash forward, unleashing a hail of ethereal blades in a two, three, four, or five foot square cone in front of you. All beings hit take two times weapon damage and are inflicted with bleed three. It's 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 deflect and then blade beam. Mm-hmm. The next is follow my lead. Your dance draws even those who know nothing to follow your lead. The difficulty is hard for the range is self. The duration is instant, lasts for three rounds, and the cooldown is four rounds. After you activate this spell, whenever you move, whether through the dance ability or regular movement, you leave a single square line behind you. Anything caught in this line must perform a contested arcanting check. On a failure, they are pulled along with you, moving the same number of squares you do, and take 1, 2, 3, or 5d6 plus 5 force damage. After this movement, the line disappears. Large plus adversaries cannot be dragged with you, instead taking your weapon's damage in pure damage as you pass over them. <laughs> that's, that's nice. And I'm suddenly reminded of the Field Knight being able to charge and drag everyone with him. Yep. Oh, see, then we have roll call. Call forth your blades for a grand attack. Difficulty of hard four, range of five squares that ends in a seven by seven area field. The duration is instant and the cooldown is five rounds. Summon two, three, four, or five of your blades to automatically attack up to two, three, four, or five of your adversaries within the area field. While this attack uses the stats of each individual blade, it does not activate the engraved arcane or spell blade abilities. This attack may target the same target at most twice in one round. Mm -hmm. So you're going to pull out all your big weapons when you do this. Oh, yeah. So next is silence, then applause. Your dance shall leave them breathless. Difficulty of hard four, range is 12 squares, that ends in an 11 by 11 area field. The duration is instant and lasts for two rounds, and the cooldown is four rounds. Quiet down everything within the area field. No sound can be made inside, and no spells may be cast inside or into the field. This lasts for two rounds. After the effect ends, every being inside takes two, four, six, or eight d6 force damage. <laughs> that would be the applause, then, I take it. <clears throat> I guess that'd be th when we talk about thunderous applause I don't think anyone means it literally <laughs> see next is soul strike strike at the core of a target's soul the difficulty is an arcanting attack the range is melee the duration is instant and the cooldown is three times per short rest after a successful attack the spell activates and inflicts a critical hit if this hit kills the target, it does not add to your sword play spell limit and refills one sword enchanted with engraved arcane. You you literally soul trapped and used them to, to recharge your weapon. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have the last dance. I like the name of that one. Our final dance together. Difficulty. Our canting attack range is 10 squares. Duration is instant. Cooldown is 5 rounds. Upon successfully casting this attack, launch towards your target and inflict 2, 3, 4, or 5d6 plus finesse physical damage. If the target has less than 20% remaining HP, add an additional 2d6 pure damage. 
It's assassinate. It is. And lastly, we have two to tango. Parallel dimensions often dance alongside ours. You simply tap into that. Difficulty, our canting attack. Range, six squares. Duration, instant. Lasts for two rounds. Cooldown, four rounds. Teleports to attack a target in range. Hello, more cold steel. If this attack hits, you spawn two additional illusions of yourself. These copies may immediately teleport and attack any target in range using your equipped weapon. After these attacks hit, heal for the damage done. After this, gain the buff threes a crowd for two rounds. This buff prevents adversaries from targeting you until the two illusions are gone. The illusions die upon taking any damage. After the buff wears off, the illusions vanish. Um, bunch of decoys that, that do actual damage, Monk. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'd say I can see why I can see why Trevor was excited for us to tackle the bl the um, blade dancer. Mm -hmm. Now, is its gishiness on the same level as the Inquisitor? No, but that's a high bar. Yeah. Plus, this is. Remember that this game does gishing way different than Heaven's and Heresies does. Mm -hmm. Both can gish basically anyone if they really want to. There's just different ways of executing them. Yeah. I'd say when it comes to the Blade Dancer, this is less of what a lot of. This is less of the gish that a lot of people would think of, unless you're, unless you're picking the subclass all about it. Mm -hmm. And more of. The and more of people who want to be um, Jedi analog or or <laughs> or Virgil. Virgil, I, I would definitely say Virgil, especially with two to Tango, and especially with the fact that when he's in Devil Trigger in Devil May Cry Five, he can spawn a literal blue clone of himself. Mm -hmm. So, uh. Yeah, Spellblade specialization is Virgil with all of his goodies. Uh, range <laughs> the the range specialization is Dante because it's guns and swords, bitches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. And I think in character, hasn't it been hasn't it been stated that Dante is more is better with his guns than he is with his swords? Technically, yes. Although it's such a close margin that it's really not necessary to measure. Mm -hmm. He's certainly better at fighting in general than Virgil is. He still manages to kick Virgil's ass while Virgil's been uh, waiting and resting after going through gauntlets and gauntlets of enemies. Mm-hmm. Now, I can I can see my of the of the setups here. Um, I could see the two that I like the most are Art of the Spellblade and Art of Precision. That's not to say Art of Distance is bad or anything. It's just it's just when it's just when one when one of them is I never miss, and the other one it the other one is crazy shit. Mm -hmm. um, of course, art with art of with art of precision, since it's non-exclusive. Um, imagine giving that to say a combat medic. Mm -hmm. Or a necromancer. Mm -hmm. You know, people who have to who have to keep it who have to keep hitting in order to in order to maintain their resources. Mm -hmm. Um, I would bring up the I would bring up the art of distance, but that's exclusive, so not going to use that for any multi-classing experiments. Mm -hmm. House rules are another are another story, but even though we've made the the Devil May Cry jokes and the Cold Steel jokes, the Blade Dancer is very clearly for those who want to. 
Play the fantasy of the precise sword master. You want to be the sword master that overwhelms the battlefield with your technique. Mm -hmm. Also, for anyone who has a penchant for uh, French fencing, apparently. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to ask Trevor if there, if there, if there's if he if he was on any sort of if he was on any sort of fencing club at one point. And the sole reason I end up butchering my own, my French is because one out of practice and two, um, I didn't you I when I did when I did fencing the only reason I used a fr I used a French handle is because it was the only one I could get only one I could get. That it was either that or an Italian handle, and I'm not, I'm not doing an Italian handle. Those th those Un things are weird. Understandable. It's not that I don't know how they yeah. work. I know how they work. It's just weird. Mm -hmm. Uncomfortable doesn't feel right to you. Understandable. Well, they're made for. They're clearly made for somebody smaller. But Monk, I think I think that's basically all fucking fencing foils for us. French one isn't so bad. Um, the German pistol like one wasn't too, wasn't too bad either. Yeah, but the German pistol like one is really fucking weird. Yeah. <laughs> I just li I just like bringing up the German pistol one because because of all the people who give me shit about the whole gunblade thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then we have the larger part of the of this little endeavor, a mini expansion known as Nightfall, which is yep. very too spoopy five me. Definitely something my girlfriend would like. Uh and with this we ha with this we have some new rules, some new spells, the new equipment, and I'm go we're going to be skipping over the lo the lore and monsters part because we didn't really cut we didn't really cover lore in the core book, and we definitely didn't cover the monster list. Yep. Although there are some, uh, there's also two new species and five new specializations to look into. Mm-hmm. So let's start. Let's start with this, and this this describes itself as a mini expansion. Mm -hmm. But there's a few th before we can even get to that. We, there's a few minor things we have to get to that are going to be covered. One is the new damage type, ecliptic. Ecliptic inflicts one d plus one d six additional damage to creatures without the keywords chaotic, corrupted, cursed, nightfall, pumpkin, skeleton, undead, or wolf. However, if an attack or spell that inflicts ecliptic damage critically fails, it inflicts madness on its user. <laughs> well, that's fun. Mm -hmm. And we also have a new condition, Terrify. If a previously feared unit is hit with another fear condition, it must perform a hard for mentality or vitality check. On a failure, they are stunned after fleeing. And then we have a clarification on fear. Target performs a contested mentality power check on their turn after receiving the fear condition. On a failure, they run base movement away from the square or being that caused the fear. This procs reactionary strikes. So, good to see that being clarified. Mm -hmm. uh, then we also have some quick clarifications first on dice roll. Uh, dice pool, sorry. A dice pool consists of your base virtue dice, plus any bonus dice, plus any auto hits or auto misses. Um, no more than four bonus die, and no more than two auto hit and five auto miss. Then with re with re rolling, re rolled dice count as natural dice. When re rolling a check, you must keep one one result and may save one six result if they are rolled. This only this only changes when you roll a critical miss. When this happens, you must keep two one results, if any, instead of one. Uh, then with auto hits and misses, 
Both auto hits and auto misses add to your dice pool and do not remove dice you roll with. An auto hit die adds a 6 to your result and acts as a natural hit. An auto miss die adds a 1 to your result and, res and treats it as a natural miss. Uh, then we have a rule that I've used quite a bit when it comes to, ro when it comes to rounding. Always round up. I'm pretty sure that was stated in the original, too. Hold on. Yeah, uh, under dice pool limit, where it talks about the original 16 dice, uh, 10 base virtue for bonus, and two auto hit dice. Or, five, and your negatives go above five auto miss dice. That's all stated in the dice pool limit. Mm -hmm. And then it says rounding. Sometimes rounding may be required. Always round up. It's in the base one, too, so I don't think that was needed for clarification unless people were missing that somehow by not reading the rules in the first place. Which is a distinct possibility. Yes. that's. I'm guessing that's why he put it in all caps this time around. Mm -hmm. I, wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if, um, if, he had so if he had some players who did, who did not know how to read. Or we're rounding down to fudge results. That is also a distinct possibility. You know what we call something like that, people? When you don't pay attention to the rules and do something opposite to them that it advantages you? We call that cheating! Do I need to bring, do I need to bring up what I do to cheaters at my table? Yes. I think it's actually necessary here, especially since we're in a spoopy expansion. You have one of two options. Option A, you drink a bottle of bacon so of bacon soda. Not baking soda, I'm not trying to kill you. Bacon bacon soda. B A C O N. Soda flavored like bacon. It's disgusting. The only time I break it out is specifically for these things. Or you can take the pain glass. What is the pain <laughs> glass, you may ask? It is a shot glass filled with water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, Tabasco sauce, Frank's Red Hot sauce, tiger sauce, sriracha, and ground-up jalapeno seeds. <laughs> and you and you've got and it's not something that you can just sip. You got to go through the whole damn thing. Have fun. Don't cheat. That is the sole reason that I have th that I have this thing. Mm -hmm. Because if I want to keep people from cheating, I have to I have to make the punishment worse than the crime. Anyway, rounds. A round is a collection of everyone's individual turns. I think this was I think this was in the core book. I can check that real quick. Mm -hmm. Uh, find rounds if it will find. The word round is a lot, so I don't know if it actually has. Rounds and turns. Yes, here we go. A round contains every player and adversary's individual turn. Everyone participating in combat gets a turn based on their initiative from highest to lowest. A full round is between 6 and 15 seconds in the game universe, depending on how many are participating. And then turns are broken down into two phases of movement and action. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we get to one of one of our. Then we get to our first new species, the candle mental. Candela mental. Candela mental. Before, <laughs> j the candela mental are a beautiful species, lovingly crafted of hardened wax by Jacko Lantern, and filled with the divine light from his lantern. These elementals are the brightest light in the constant war of the night. 
Wait a minute. When did we suddenly jump into a Shin Megami Tensei? <laughs> Before Jack was given his power by Iloa, he was well recognized for his carving ability, creating the most beautiful masterpieces. While his pumpkin designs were widely used in his town, only a special few received his unique wax carvings. These carvings were intricate and beautiful, no two alike. He carefully crafted them, putting a bit of his joy in each. Now, after receiving his power, Jack's creations are given a fraction of his power. He still creates his wax figures, though now they take on a life of their own. He uses the enchanted wax found within his pumpkin warding lights and forms each individual candle mental. They get their hardened outer layers from this wax and receive a powerful soul from Eloah's divine light. Then we have purifying limits. The divine light that coats them is a powerful war that chases off even the evilest creatures. With this light, they restore hope to the galaxy, especially during the Nights of Hallow. No darkness can drown out their eternal light. Why am I thinking of Green Lantern? I, the Lantern Pledge was just going through my head. Uh, so then now, we have... but, but because they're candles, I want to make a candle elemental pledge. <laughs> See, then we have their stats. Age. Candle, can, candle elementals have short lifespans. They spawn fully grown and last for 20 to 30 years. Height. Average height is around 3 feet. They're shorties. Mm -hmm. Speed is 7 squares. They're fast shorties. They speak, read, and write common. They also speak the unique language of divinal. Divinial. D divinial. Then we have traits. Divine flame. Candelemental's hardened wax shell is surrounded by a pure fire. This fire gives you immunity to fire damage, but a weakness to water damage. You may use the light object arcane fire spell for free with a reduced cooldown of 15 seconds. And you and you may have eight items lit at once. Anything lit by the spell gives off plus two squares of light. Since it's free, no charge state. Mm -hmm. Then you have lights against the dark. Candelementals are one of the few lights able to stand against the eternal dark of nightfall. When fighting against nightfall or corrupted creatures, you take 1d6 less damage any time you are hit by their attack or spell. Additionally, you're immune to the fear condition caused by strong or less Nightfall adversaries. See, then we have Hardened Wax. The hardened wax shell of a Candelemental is uniquely resilient yet easy enough to mold. During a long rest, you may shape yourself to look the way you'd like as long as it maintains a humanoid form. Once per long rest, you may quickly melt the wax on your hand to fit a simple shape you can see. For example, you see a simply locked chest in front of you. You may shape your hand to be the key that can fit this lock. This cannot unlock complex machines, etc. Useful. Well, Candelemental Smuggler. I can see it. Mm hmm. Then we have Warding Light. The fire that surrounds you is excellent at warding against corruption. As an extra action, you may target an ally within two squares suffering from confusion, fear, madness, stun, or, ta or taunted. taunted, and perform a hard four or canting or medicament check. On a success, you remove that condition. This may be performed once per ally per short rest. Nice. And lastly in it, you have Young Visionaries. You may be young, but you see the world in a way many others cannot. Since Candelementals do not have ancestry paths, add plus one virtue point to any chosen virtue and gain plus one bonus skill point instead. Very cool. Let's see, then we have Skeleton, and ugh, this guy is just bursting out of it. Spooky, scary skeletons. I mean... How else do you get a skeleton, Monk? I don't think you want me to answer that. Uh, 
<laughs> I kind of do, but, you know, we have stuff to get through. Mm -hmm. These aren't your everyday skeletons that shamble around the place or that some silly mechromancer calls up. No, these Silly? Fuck you! No, these beings are intelligent, coherent. Heck, they're brighter than some living that I know. I don't know what strange magics brought them back, and neither do they. But of all the creatures that come from Nightfall, they're definitely my, my preferred ones to meet. Mausoleum of Undeath. Skeletons are a unique breed of beings, though that name does not truly fit. <coughs> they are far different from the familiar skeletal creature. However, they, they do have a somewhat similar origin. These beings enter the world through the ancient mausoleum found in the Grave End Mountains. Every so often, the large ferrite do doors creak open, and one sh and out shambles out a new being. Skeletons have no memories of any past life, if they had one to begin with. While they appear to be undead, they don't seem to have been raised through traditional magic. While skeletons cannot recall any past, they mention seeing a brilliant light calling out to them. They will then move towards it right before they appear inside the dusty old tomb. Why am I thinking of Brook? Mm. I can't imagine why. And Wandering Soul. Skeletons often wander around the domain of Nightfall. No real direction, but with a desire to survive. Thankfully, they have no need to eat and, and appear to be sustained by the glowing core under their rib cage. Surprised they aren't made into piñatas. Many, anyway, many creatures of Nightfall pay no attention to these wanderers. Even the lunar star Eclipse seems to ignore them. So they wander on until they meet someone new or find a doorway out. And upon meeting upon meeting a living non-nightfall being they gain the ability to converse immediately knowing whatever languages that creature knows this can sometimes backfire however as once this happens it won't happen again what's more interesting is that they have no organs nor way to speak yet they can converse in a raspy rattling noise additionally they learn some basic mannerisms however as with the speech this can backfire should they run into a beast or the like first they also often gain names based on how the beings they first come across are called. It should be noted that once these skeletons come across a living being, they gain an intelligence boost. They have even become a great ally in the fight against the chaos of Nightfall. Then we have stats. As far as age, skeletons have no actual age cycle that we know of, and the first one spawned 30 years ago and is still alive. Maybe we should just say mobile. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Height. Average height is 4 to 6 feet. Speed. 5 squares. Language. They speak, read, and write the languages of the first living being they come across knows. Which is why if they come across something like a bear, they can speak bear. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Then we have traits. Just bones. Skeletons have no organs to speak of. Due to this, they do not need to breathe and are immune to poison, bleeding, and suffocating conditions. Does that mean they can survive in space without a void suit? Good question. Let's see, imitate life. Skeletons carefully study the living, giving a bit, gaining a bit of life after watching. When a living creature succeeds at a non-attack check within your nightfall vision range, you may choose to add a successful roll to your skill as well. This may be performed five times per long rest. Wow. Let's see, then we have Nightfall Vision. Skeletons have no eyes, but they can sense the world around them. You can see as normal beings can. However, that which surrounds you is crafted from what looks like webs and hardened black mist forming the detailed shapes of your surroundings. This vision can be interfered with by beings you, that prevent blinded or oh, sorry. ah, can be interfered by things that prevent ethereal movement or the blind condition. If you are blinded, you are treated as as being in dim light instead. Then we have unbound souls. 
Skeletons are unsure how they came to be, but they have no master and no binding spell has been placed upon them. You are immune to being controlled and unaffected by spells and abilities that target undead creatures. As a side effect of this, you can control an additional summon if you have an ability that allows you to do so. Ah! Which means if you're a skeleton necromancer, you have an additional summon. Mm -hmm. And first impressions, skeletons start with a base 3 mentality and cannot add to their mentality at character creation. Depending on which creature you first interacted with, you gain bonus starting mentality. If you first met a beast, plus 1. If you first met a humanoid, plus 2. If you first met a challenging or greater alien, plus 3. If you first met a prime or a dragon, plus 4. Skeleton who becomes a naturalist. There's a there's a terrifying thought. I'm good at this, remember? Mm -hmm. Next we have Clean Slate. Skeletons have no history, therefore they have no ancestral path to choose from. Because of this, they may add plus one virtue point to any virtue excluding mentality. Additionally, they gain plus one bonus skill point to distribute. And that covers species. And now we have some new specializations for the classes we talked about in the past. Starting with, an ex and this is an exclusive, the Candymancer. The Candyman can because he mixes it with love and makes the world taste good. Candymancers are mechromancers who dive into the summoning and manipulation of the curious candy creations of the Mad Lord of Nightfall. These summoners mainly prefer summoning the summoning of one creature in particular, the Sweet Tooth Golem. This Sweet Summons is the, is the first ability they get. While the Sweet Tooth Golems may not be entirely undead, they are filled with the haunting spirits from the Nightfall domain. As a Channel 2 action, you may attempt to manifest the Sweet Tooth Golem in a 2x2 two two square up to 8 squares away from you. This Golem does not count as an undead for your Undead Domination ability, lasts 3 hours, and can be summoned twice per short rest, and has the following stats. So Nightfall, Candy, Elemental, Wraith, and Strong Metatypes. Power 7, Finesse 6. Vitality 8, Mentality 3, Judgment 2, and Charisma 3. Has Heavy Armor, 300 HP, a movement of 6, 2 attacks, either the Candy Repeaters, which have a range of 2040 and deal 3d6 piercing damage, or their Massive Arms, which deal 3d6 force damage. Has a Defense of 4, Dual Wield of 6, Mechanics 3, Muscle 6, and tracking and hunting six. Let's see then then its abilities. Candy lobber. As an attack action, the golem may fire a sticky candy bomb in a seven by seven area field up to sixteen squares away. All beings inside take twelve pure damage and have their movement speed reduced by two squares. Alternatively, this golem may consume this bomb to add plus one auto hit auto hit die to their next attack and heal 2d6 plus 10 HP. If the golem consumes the bomb, any targets affected by the nom are ejected and take 10 pure damage. Called nom because the, the golem eats them. Mm -hmm. Nom, and nom, nom. Nom. After a massive arms attack critically hits the target, this golem may force them to perform a contested muscle dodge check. On a failure, the golem consumes them, and they are considered grasped. Each round they are consumed, they take 2d6 plus 2 force damage. <laughs> Let's see, then we have... Pilotable. These sweet tooth golems can be piloted by a Mecromancer. While a Mecromancer is piloting, the golem receives plus 1 attack. I have to say it now, monk. Tech Romancer! <laughs> You have turned the Mecromancer into a Techromancer character by making them a Candymancer. Mm -hmm. and, sw and Sweet Mist. 
These golems release a sweet mist around them, which may heal an adjacent ally by 1d6 plus 3 HP twice per combat. This healing is not limited by the daily healing, but may only affect the same ally twice per combat. Nice. They also ga they also gain sugar rush. During the duration of the golem, all allies within nine squares of this creature have plus two base movement speed, and their incoming healing is increased by one d six plus two once per round. Wait, so does that affect the sweet mist from the golem itself? No, sugar rush is a separate ability that that isn't tied to the sweet tooth golem. Yeah, no, but so so here's what I'm saying. Sugar Rush is a separate ability. It increases incoming healing by 1d6 plus 2 per, uh, once per round. Sweet Mist is a healing ability from the Golem. It's incoming healing. I would say yes. Until, but so, clarification the, is definitely needed. Yeah, but that would make the total healing of Sweet Mist 2d6 plus 5. Mm -hmm. See, that, uh, at 10th level, we have Candy Spirits. You may summon forth two candy bag soul containers twice per long rest. These containers are filled with a spirit bar. When consumed, your level one weapons gain plus two souls and you heal 2d6 plus four hit points. You also gain haunter tricks. You may now freely use the haunt ether spell with no cooldown. Additionally, you can create bigger haunting effects such as strange creatures walking through the halls, large illusionary thunderstorms, etc. Remember that haunt ether is basically just prestidigitation or taumaturgy for uh for for necromancers for the ether skill tree. Or spell tree, excuse me. Mm -hmm. Oh. At 15th level, you gain ghostly treats. Once per long rest, you may summon an ethereal table filled with delicious sweets. Any ally that eats one of these treats is considered to have gone through a short rest. This may only be eaten once per long rest. It's Hero's Feast. It's Hero's Feast, or, you know, pushing forward in Heavens and Heresies. Mm -hmm. At 20th level, you gain Candy Repeaters. Your golem's Candy Repeaters now inflict plus 1d6 additional damage, and you may now summon a ghostly copy of them to use as your own weapon. Once per combat, you may target up to five targets and perform a candy repeater attack against each of them. These attacks may all target the same target. That's <laughs> that's the sweetest Daka I've ever seen. Yeah. 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 Because that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing a... I'm I am I am imagining a mod deuce firing Jolly Ranchers. And the Jolly Rancher isn't big enough there. I'm imagining a mod deuce shooting Snickers bars. <laughs> hey, they're about the same size as 50 BMG. You can't fault me. No, I cannot. So, a mod deuce shooting Snickers bars. Full size. Mm -hmm. So it's the uh, it's it's the best uh, neighbor on your street, everybody. Except um, this is going to require more than dental work when you're done. <laughs> Let's see. Then we have a specialization for the naturalist warding lights. Naturalists are the few gifted with the ability to channel the warding powers of Jack O' Lantern, thanks to their connection to the natural world around them. So you start out with, first, Lantern Staff. Your book transforms into a copy of Jack's Lantern Staff. This staff allows you to perform all your regular passages, but is considered a ranged weapon. This weapon does a base 2d6 purified damage. It has a range of 1530 squares, can store two spells inside it, and gains plus 1d6 damage every fifth level. Additionally, this staff illuminates a 7x7 area centered on you even in total and magical darkness. Not too, ba not too bad. Um, I'm telling you, give it to a skeleton. Mm -hmm. Then Purification Passage. You gain a new passage. The light which was given to me shall push back against the encroaching madness. 
While this passage is active, your staff illuminates an 11 by 11 area around you. All adversarial, corrupted, nightfall, chaos, and demon units take 3, 4, 5, or 66 purified damage each round they remain inside. Additionally, all allies with inside the field are immune to mind-controlling and demonic effects. This lasts three rounds with a four-round cooldown. I'd like to point out that uh, you, you kind of staggered that weirdly. It's all adversarial, corrupted, nightfall, chaos, and demon units. So mm -hmm. any, any one of those four that is adversarial to you. Mm -hmm. Let's see. At 10th level, you gain Pacifying Illumination. The light of your staff gives off an aura of pacification in the area field. All beings inside with you, at least three plus judgment, are naturally passive toward you, not perceiving you as a threat unless you show aggression first. When using speechcraft or performance to discuss with those in your area field, you roll with plus one auto hit. Nice. Let's see. At 15th level, you gain healing warmth. As an action, you may target an ally within 12 squares and heal them by 46 plus 5 HP. After this healing, they gain a warmth that gives them resistance to frigid or ice damage and prevents the burning condition for two rounds. Nice. I'm going to heal. So that de that definitely ca that definitely counts for it. Um, yep. And at level twenty, you gain let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. As a channel two action, once per day, you may fully illuminate a seventy-one by seventy-one square area field centered on yourself. This area reveals all hidden items, traps, or be or beings, and cancels all but superlative level darkness. This lasts for one hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the, yeah, it's. You know how we were making Green Lantern jokes. Yeah, I'd say, this, I'd say a warding lights naturalist counts as a green lantern. Yeah, that's very true. But then we have Knight of Ruin, which is a specialization for the field knight, and the is exclusive. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think each of them, each of these have been exclusive. Yes, all three of these that have been specific to one class have been exclusive. Yep. The field knights who follow this path give into a way of ruin and destruction. They take other Mizera and his knight. They take after Mizera and his knights, mounting the nightmares and bringing terror with them. So first you gain Mare of Ruin. You make a pact with a nightmare and may summon it at will. You may mount this nightmare for half your movement on your turn. While mounted, you gain an additional reaction to deflect with. Your nightmare may still attack and move on your turn. When you are hit by an attack, the attacker must roll 1d2 to see if they hit you or your nightmare. The attacker may choose who they hit if they use the aim movement action. If your nightmare is killed, it may be resummoned after one hour. Fun. So next is Ruination Charge. Your Nightmare gains the effects of your Jump Charge ability and charges up to their movement in squares instead of yours. Instead of dragging targets with them, this creature makes a Hooves attack against each target that fails the check and inflicts plus 1d6 damage. You may also use your reaction to perform an attack on an adversary that fails the check. The Nightmare's Hooves attack inflicts plus 1d6 damage every 5th level. Nice. At 10th level, you gain Desolation Strike. Twice per combat after a successful attack, you may unleash a strike that inflicts 
plus 3d6 bonus elemental damage. Additionally, this strike grants all allied future attacks against them plus one bonus die for five rounds. This strike inflicts plus 2d6 additional damage every fifth level. Just more and more stacking damage. Mm -hmm. At 15th level, you gain Aura of Misera. Your mere presence inflicts fear in, t in the hearts of weaker mortals. Gain plus two bonus levels in the Intimidation skill. Any adversary who fails the check and your, and your nightmare runs over during a Ruination charge is inflicted with fear. If they are inflicted with fear, you may heal for 1d6 plus 4 HP. This healing may heal you up to four times per day. A target may only be feared every three rounds. I will make you fear me. Mm -hmm. And at 20th level, you gain true horror. Your bond with your nightmare has grown strong, and it has evolved with it. Your nightmare tra transforms into a nightmare lead with the following stats. So, nightmare lead... Nightfall, Shadow, Wraith, Beast, and Strong um, types. Power 6, Finesse 8, Vitality 5, Mentality 5, Judgment 5, Charisma 4. Has Heavy Armor, 350 HP, Movement of 17. Has 3 yeah. attacks. Um, Dark Gaze, which is a 612 ranged attack that does 2d6 shadow damage. And Shadow Hose, which do 2d6 plus 4 force damage. And then, then we have Balance 3, Intimidation 3, Hunting 4, Muscle 3, and Weapon 6. And as far as its abilities, we start with Ethereal. A nightmare only partially materializes in our plane of existence. Attacks made against this creature roll with minus 3 bonus dice, unless the attacker has expertise in either workings. Sorry, ether workings. Next is Leading Fear. Nightmare leads may summon up to two nightmares per day and may have two under their control at one time. Nightmares under the control roll with plus one auto-hit dice on attacks with their dark gaze. Then we have... We minions. Mm -hmm. Living Nightmare. Nightmares perform a contested intimidation mentality check once every two rounds for free against the target if that against the target that can see them on success the target is inflicted with fear as an extra action a nightmare may consume the target's fear condition to heal 1d6 hp and inflict 1d6 plus 1 ether damage to their target i make you fear me and then i eat your fear to kill you mm -hmm. <clears throat> And lastly, Shadow Flame Hooves. The burning Shadow Flame on a Nightmare's Hooves burns all metal and heavy armor on a successful hit. This inflicts the armor break condition on the target. Nice. Let's see. And now we, ha now we have our first non-exclusive specialization. Yep. That being the Eclipse Harvester. Those that dive too deep into the study of the Nightfall Eclipse often get consumed by its encroaching madness. Okay, I just had to check to make sure, because there's a lot of stuff that it get, that it gets. Um, but it, I guess that I guess this is I guess this is a freeform one, not really tied to any one, um, or any one class. So first we have, That's... go ahead. Mm -hmm. That's what it seemed like to me. Yeah. First we have our canting. If you're not a base spellcasting class, you add plus one bonus level to our canting. Then eclipse state. Eclipse Harvesters gain a unique charge state called the Eclipse State. This state is not dedicated to any spell tree, but has several particular uses. The primary use allows you to activate your Harvest Marks abilities. Twice per short rest, you may expend one charge of this Eclipse State to cast a Novice, Apprentice, Adept, 
or mega spell, known or unknown, of any spell tree. This state recharges as a regular charge state. Okay. So you've got a way to you've got a way to cheat the casting. So then we have Harvest Marks. As an action, you may expend one of your Eclipse states to activate one of the marks below. Once you reach 12 points in the Eclipse state, you cannot, you can no longer use these marks. So we have Mark of the Black Cat. Your target is cursed with unluck and gains the expertise Unlucky. Additionally, things seem to go wrong for them often. This effect lasts for one hour. And we have Mark of the Dark Sun. You mark a grenade and toss it. Upon landing, the Great Darkness floods its area field, inflicting 2, 3, 4, or 5d6 additional ecliptic damage. This area field turns pitch black, and all beings who enter this field and cannot usually see in the dark are considered blind and cannot leave the field once inside. While inside this field, distances are tripled, no one can see in or out of the field unless they have dark vision, such as the Eyes of Shadow expertise. This field lasts one minute with a five-minute cooldown. Jesus. <clears throat> I've heard of... It's like, some, it's like somebody wanted a, um, a, reverse, a reverse flash grenade. Yeah... So, next is Mark of the Eclipsed Moon. <clears throat> you or your target is transformed into a ferocious wolfkin for three rounds. If they wish to resist transformation, they may perform a contested Arcanting Environmental Survival check to fight it. This may only affect the same target twice per short rest and cannot affect challenging or greater adversaries. Yeah, we can't we can't have all these moon references without going with werewolves. Next is Mark of the Harvest. Mark a target for four rounds. The next time your target gets hit, they ignore that damage. This then spawns a different effect based on, depending on if this was used on an ally or enemy. If used on an ally, an 11 by 11 harvest field centered on them spawns and grants all allies inside 1, 2, 3, or 4d6 plus 4 temp HP. This temp HP lasts for 3 rounds. If used on an enemy, an 11 by 11 area field spawns and summons a Harvest Howler under your control for 3 rounds. This has a 3 round cooldown. I don't think you'd want to get sent to the cornfields. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Welcome to the cornfields, motherfucker. <laughs> so ne next is the Mark of Misera. Force your target to perform a contested mentality or arcanting or ar environmental survival check. On a failure, the target is marked and inflicted with the madness condition every round for three rounds. Four round cooldown. And, we, and lastly, among the marks, we have the Mark of the Spiller Spider. You mark an 11 by 11 area and fill it with a Spiller Web Spider's acidic web. You can move through it normally. All other beings are affected by the negatives it applies. <coughs> Alternatively, you may mark yourself and gain the ability to climb walls and ceilings without making any noise. These marks last two minutes with a two minute cooldown. What about a legion of spiders? One of the few good memes that came out of that place. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then... At, then we have... Spe and that's all spec level 5. At 10th level, you gain Solar Hex Field. 
The Nightfall Eclipse corrupts all magic that falls under its gaze. Twice per short rest, you may set up a 13 by 13 field as an action up to 13 squares away from you. As a reaction, or simple action out of combat, you may attempt to cast the Counterspell Reflection Spell against any magic cast into or through this field. And as a reminder of what the Counterspell Reflection Spell is... Let me just get there as soon as I can. It's Apprentice Level. Difficulty Contested Arcanting. Range is 9, 10, or 15 squares. Duration is Reaction. Cooldown is 4 rounds. Cast this spell as a reaction. If you succeed, you, can you cancel a successfully casted spell of your current spell level or lower. This spell may be cast to automatically cancel an out-of-control spell of equal level. Example, if you are level 10, you can cancel Adept or Lower spells. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so yeah, that ma that makes this nightmare even worse. <laughs> Indeed. Um, at spec level fifteen, you gain mad sorcery. You may now fully recharge your eclipse state during a short rest. And eclipse overflow, as the eclipse state meets its peak, your power grows. For every four points in your eclipse state, you may add plus one potency to any spells you cast. Wow. And at 20th level, you gain the Black Moon Howls. As the Eclipse reaches its highest point, the Black Moon unleashes its fearful howl. Once your Eclipse state reaches the max of 12 points expended, you may release the mad energy inside you. Once per long rest, target up to 12 beings within 90 squares of you and unleash a terrifying howl. The Eclipse takes shape above you, and all targets must perform a contested or canting check. On a failure, inflict 46 plus 6 ecliptic damage to all targets. On a success, inflict half as much. You may target the same beings multiple times with this. However, each additional charge targeting the same being adds 2d6 and not the 4d plus 2d6 damage and not the 4d6 plus 6. So basically, if you're facing a boss, you can just stack it on and and do um 2066 plus 6 damage. Because you target 12 beings. Mm -hmm. The first time is 46 plus 6. The le next 11 times are all plus 2d6, so that's plus 22d6 on top of the initial 46 plus 6. 26d6 plus 6 damage. Yep. So then we have Fearmonger. Some come to face some come face to face with their darkest fears during the nights of Hallow. And rather than run, they embrace it fully. They give in to nightfall and accept Mizera's blessing, quote unquote. They are forever marked with a sign of his curse. But with it comes a powerful gift. Fearmongers dive into the power of the domain of nightfall, causing others to face their own worst fears. We start with Mark of Mizera. You are marked by the Curse of Mizera. This curse manifests in a nightmarish deformity. This could be huge horns that curve around your face, or perhaps it takes shape in a sinister smile that you cannot put away, or a burst of maniacal laughter. Maybe it takes the shape of, in the form of a desire to constantly lie. Whatever its effect takes, it is a noticeable curse. You do, however, gain a plus one bonus level in a skill of your choice. Uh, I I hope some GM I hope GMs get creative with the with the kind of curse and how it takes effect. Mm -hmm. uh, next we have gaze into the abyss. You still you stare into a target's soul as an extra action. The target then stares back at you, seeing the mad domain of nightfall. They must perform a contested mentality check against your highest virtue or intimidation skill. On a failure, they are struck with the fear condition and take 2, 3, 4, or 6 d6 corruption damage. 3 round cooldown. And now I'm thinking of Judge Death. Okay. But at spec level 10, you gain two more abilities. First is Revel in Fear. 
Once every two rounds, when an adversary is first feared, you may choose to amplify or embrace their fear. If you amplify their fear, perform a contested mentality intimidation check. On a success, add an additional round to their fear. If you embrace their fear, you remove their fear condition and heal for 10% of your max HP. Hmm. An interesting way to he interesting way to utilize fear. Cuz we see we see monsters about talk about feasting on people's fear, but we never get it literally. Yep, this is the second one. Mm -hmm. The first was the nightmare. Yep. And next is Aura of Terror. You carry a terrifying aura with you. This often makes you a hated or hunted individual as mortals loathe what they fear. You add plus two bonus levels to the intimidation skill. Which certainly makes sense, given given what we're seeing about this particular area of Vale. Oh. Mm -hmm. At 15th level, you gain Show Me What Haunts You. Once per day, you may investigate the heart of a target and see what their deepest, most rooted fear is. You also gain I Am What Haunts You. If you know what someone fears most, you may attempt a challenging or canting check once per hour to manifest an illusion of it. Once I know your fear, I will make you have it. Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we, and at 20th, we have Call of Nightfall. Once per day, you may remove all light within a 25 by 25 area field centered on you. You see as if it is fully lit, but all others without the ability to see in the dark suffer the blind condition. While in this darkness, you gain plus one auto hit die on all attacks and cannot be revealed from covert unless you attack or the target has the keyword nightfall. Additionally, warning lights and cand elementals see, can see you regardless. Which makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, should we go over the new spells? Yeah, it's only three pages. Mm -hmm. Spells of Nightfall. The magic of Nightfall is a non-unique spell tree. It uses your arcanting virtue to cast and does not have an energizing state. Instead, it uses Nightfall stages. Once per round, when an adversary is inflicted with fear, add one night stage. The more night stages you have, the more night stages you have in combat, the more potent the spell you can cast. These spells have no spell level, and may be taken any time you acquire a new spell. These spells advance at levels 5, 10, 15, and 20 like normal spells. Okay. Oh, I get, I get, I get it. You, it's, it's almost like a reversal of charge state. With charge yeah, state, you're trying to, oh, you're trying not to overcast. With this one, you want to, you want to cast. Well, it's more that unlike uh, regular spells where, you know, you have novice to magus. Uh, the only way to stage up however many spells you can, which which uh, stage spells you can cast, is to inflict fear on targets in battle. So the more fear you inflict, the more spells of nightfall you have access to in that battle. Mm -hmm. So first we have stage zero spells. We have, and we start with Candy Corn Spike, which is a, which is a arcanting attack with a range of 12 squares, instant duration, three round cooldown. Summon a Candy Corn Crystal, shape it into a sharpened spike and launch it towards your target. This inflicts 2d6 piercing damage and bleed 2. Very nice. Let's see, then fun-sized. Edward Elric, is that you? He wouldn't appreciate that. Get to the back of the line. <laughs> oh. Hard 4 difficulty. Range is touch. Duration is channel 2, 5 minutes. Cooldown is 1 minute. You transform yourself or a willing ally into a minuscule version of themselves, no higher than 8 inches. This lasts for a 5 minute duration or until cancelled or interrupted. When fun sized, the target has the same armor and HP but inflicts half damage. It's mini! Mm -hmm. Let's see, then we have Spiller Web Trap. Let's see, av average 3 difficulty, adjacent range. 
instant duration four um, four rounds cooldowns two rounds set a spiller web trap in an adjacent square any adversary that walks within a three by three area field of the trap sets it off all adversaries within that field are then grasped for one round cannot move or perform reactions and allies get plus one bonus on attacks against them nice See, next we have Sugar Rush. Average 3 difficulty, range is 8 squares, duration is instant 3 rounds, cooldowns 3 rounds. Target an ally within range and grant them an additional 2 squares of base movement for 3 rounds. Nice. Yeah, it's, it's the speed portion of the Sugar Rush special that uh, the Candy Mancers get. Mm-hmm. And that's all the stage zero spells. Now we get to stage one. So you've First inflicted one being with fear. Mm -hmm. First is candy delivery. Duration's easy two. Range is adjacent. Duration is instant. Cooldown is 15 minutes. You summon forth a candy bar in one, two, three, or four squares adjacent to you. Anyone who eats this candy bar is immune to the fear condition for two minutes. It's anti-fear. Mm -hmm. But they still have to eat their candy. Yep. So next is Preemptive Terrors. Difficulty is hard 4. Range is 10 squares. Duration is instant 3 rounds. Cooldown is 3 rounds. After successfully casting the spell, choose a target. The target is then marked with a rune of nightfall. If the target has not been affected by the fear condition after the 3 round duration... They are inflicted with fear. If they have been affected by the fear condition, they are terrified. Very nice. And that's all the stage one spells. Now for stage two. First is Drone of Misera. An Arcanatech drone designed to channel the power of Misera is a horrifying sight. I'm sure. Difficulty is hard for... Range is 12 squares. Duration is channel 2, 2 rounds. Cooldown is 4 rounds. After successfully casting the spell, target a square within range. A small drone then flies from your pocket and unleashes a display within a 5x5 five five area field. The head of Mazera will pop up and mock all adversaries within the field. For the duration of the spell, all targets inside will be taunted by the drone. If those who are taunted are attacked, they will ignore the they will ignore the taunt and target their attacker. Hmm. It's an aggro bot. Mm -hmm. uh, the other stage 2 spell is Feast of Fear. Difficulty is average 3, range is 7 squares, duration is instant, cooldown is 3 rounds. Choose a target after casting this spell. If the chosen target has been feared or terrified, inflict 3d6 plus Arcanting Virtue in Eclipse Damage and heal 5, 10, 15, or 20 hit points. This may heal you three times per day. Nice. So once again, we literally that's the third time we, ha we literally have Feasting on Fear. Yep. So next is stage three. So you need you need to fear th you need to fear three creatures for this one. Shift between the light. Difficulty is hard four. Range is self. Duration is channel two. One minute. Cooldowns one minute. After the channel, you may transform yourself into a shadow. While in shadow form, you cannot be harmed by non-magical attacks and cannot be healed. You are a flat shadow lying on the ground. You may move around, but cannot walk into pure darkness. You are unaffected by gravity or standard movement barriers, and therefore may walk up walls or hang on ceilings. If you leave this form, you cannot go into it again for the cooldown duration. And that's the only one for Stage 3. Next is Stage 4. The Candy Cornado. And yes, that's Cornado. 
arguably the most ridiculous spell the Mad Ma the Mad Mage Maxi has crafted. The, the name, name alone tells us that. <laughs> Difficulty is tough five. Range is twenty squares in a seven by seven area field. Duration is channel two, four rounds. Cooldown is four rounds. Summon a massive candy corn tornado in the chosen area field. All beings inside the tornado immediately take 3, 5, 6, or 8 d6 plus 5 eclipse and piercing damage and are lifted into the sky. They may attempt a contested arcanting or flight or environmental survival check to leave the field on their next turn. If a being enters the field, it must perform the same contested check. On a failure, they are knocked into the sky and take the damage. That's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we've still got some more spells that are realm spells and mystic spells. Looks like we have uh, one spell for each of the specialized realms. Or each of the realms that were prominent in certain classes. Mm -hmm. And then a few mystic spells. So, first is Call Forth the Dead, which is exclusive. Which means that it's exclusive to Mechromancers, since it's in the Aether Realm. Mm -hmm. Difficulty is average 3, range is self, duration is channel 1, 2 hours, cooldown is 1 hour. Summon an average level undead adversary under your control in a square within range for 2 hours. You perform the channel action to summon, but not to maintain this undead. At Apprentice level, you can summon two Average Undead. At Adept, three Average Undead. At Magus, a Strong Undead. If these summoned creatures die before the duration ends, you may expend one soul to refresh the spell's cooldown. However, this does increase the casting difficulty by one. This difficulty increase resets after each short rest. A lot of risk versus reward going on there. We love that. Uh-huh. So next is Harvest Moon, which is not exclusive, oddly enough. Probably because it's a natura spell, and you can't do natura spells if you're, well, not a naturalist. Yep. Also, um, it's probably non-exclusive because of all of the title mix-ups. Possibly. <laughs> you're the only one who gets that joke, Pung. I swear. <laughs> Difficulty is hard 4, range is 30 squares in a 15 by 15 area field, duration is instant, 4 rounds, cooldown is 4 rounds. A new harvest moon looms over the field chosen. All allies in this field heal 2, 4, 6, or 8 d6 hit points and roll with plus 1 auto hit die on their next check. While this moon is active, all beings with the keyword wolf wolf with a u or dog inflict one plus 1d6 pure damage in this area field this damage increases by plus 1d6 at levels 10 and 15. think i don't know if this is the intended pronunciation but god damn it for artistic flair this is the pronunciation i'm going to use to differentiate between wolf and the other word i'm going to say wolf mm -hmm. like it's german So next we have Lantern Burner, which is a which is an arcane fire spell. Yep. Difficulty average three, range twelve squares, duration instant six rounds, cooldown four rounds. Choose a square within range and summon a tiny jack o' lantern. This pumpkin may perform an attack on your turn as an extra action. This attack uses your Arcanting or Weapons Master. This turret... Um, I don't think this is a turret, but I guess it is. Can throw a flit, can throw a flame blob up to 12, 24 squares away that inflicts 2, 3, 4, or, or 66 fire damage. After hitting a target twice, the target is inflicted with burning. This, target ha this turret has a alternate fire mode. This mode fires a stream of flame in a four-square cone around it. 
This inflicts the same damage as above, except the damage hits all beings inside. I'm going to summon a jack-o'-lantern turret. Yay! That's what it is. It's Pyro Jack. Which was just, I believe, originally called Jack Lantern in Japanese. Mm -hmm. Or Lantern Jack. <sighs> yeah. So next is Mad Laughter. This is a reflection spell. As if the name was, didn't make it obvious what spell it was. Or what realm it was. Difficulty is a contested Arcanting Mentality. Range is 15 squares. Duration is instant, 3 rounds. Cooldown is 3 rounds. Upon successful cast, the target bursts into horrifying laughter. All beings within 15 squares of this creature must perform a hard 4 Arcanting Environmental Survival or Mentality check. On a failure, they are inflicted with the fear condition. Anytime a creature gets within range of this creature or moves towards something, the creature must perform the check above. Any feared creatures take 2, 3, 4, or 5d6 reflection damage at the start of their turn. Nice. Uh, and then we get to the mystic spells. Ooh boy. First we have Hunter's Moon. Difficulty average, range self, duration 5 hours, cooldown 1 hour. Your eyes now grant the ability to see in the dark. During the spell's duration, you add plus one bonus level to your hunting, tracking, and roll with plus one auto-hit die on its checks. You may perform a contested hunting, tracking check against the target's dodge skill. On a success, your attacks roll with plus 1d6 damage against them for three rounds. This may be, this may be performed twice per target per duration. Nice. That's a good way to break out the eyes glow meme. Indeed. So next is Mystic Cleanse. Difficulty hard 4, range self, duration instant, cooldown once per long rest. The Eclipse Star consumes your built-up arcane power, reducing one of your charge states by 5 points. Nice. That's, that can certainly be useful. Um... Then we have Nightfall Servants. Difficulty none, range 10 squares, duration 5 hours, cooldown none. You may summon up to 4 marionette servants to help perform simple tasks for you. These tasks cannot be actions such as firing a gun. They can, however, carry items, open unlocked doors, and hold ammo for you, hold ammo for you etc. These marionettes have 20 HP and will despawn once hitting 0. Servitors. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next we have Puppetry. Dif difficulty easy 2, range 35 squares, duration instant, cooldown 1 minute. You can target an object that can be controlled by actions, such as a starship's piloting wheel or a unmanned turret, and place puppetry control over it. This control allows you to perform simple actions. The spell does not let you to perform reactions, nor does it allow you to perform multiple actions at one time. You may only have one puppetry object at a time. For example, you may pilot the ship with the starship's piloting wheel, but not dodge with it. Makes sense. Mm-hmm. And then we have Rend Curse. Difficulty hard 4, range is touch, duration instant, cooldown 1 hour. This unique spell cures many simple curses at first. Simple curses are madness or void sickness, fear, or the minor curses found on items. As you progress through the game, the spell grows stronger. At level 5 plus, the spell can remove higher tiered curses such as the Wolfkin Curse, if it has been no longer than one hour since their bite. At level 10 plus, this spell may purge more potent curses from legendary items, demonic curses, wolfkin curses of five hours or less, etc. At level 15, the spell can, cure, can entirely cure the wolfkin curse and the like within a year of receiving it. 
And at level 20, the spell can remove all curses, even the most pow powerful superlative level curses. That might be a mystic spell to take. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're something like uh, a, a combat medic that is also doing some magic-y stuff, or a naturalist, or a bunch of other stuff. So, then we get to equipment. Which and is only like two pages, I think. Which, which pretty much every category has something new. Um, it's pretty see, wordy, though. Yeah, the... So we have the, t for armors, we have the Terror Masquerade. When you succeed in an, an Arcanting or speech, Speechcraft check, the wearer may choose a target within 10 squares. That target is then affected by the Fear Condition, or you may roll with an auto hit on your next Intimidation check against them. It can only be used three times a day. The Light 2 armor mm -hmm. costs 15,000 credits. Yep. Then Dread Garb, which is a medium 3 armor. When the wearer of this armor comes out of covert or lands a surprise attack, those adjacent to them or hit by their attack must perform a contested mentality covert check. On a failure, the target is knocked prone in terror. May only afflict the, the same target once per combat. I don't think that's the terrorized condition. It's just they're knocked prone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and costs 15,000. Um, then we have the laughing mantle, which is a heavy armor. An aura of nightfall surrounds the equipped unit. When hit by the when hit by the wearer, all units adjacent to the wearer must perform a contested vitality muscle check. On a failure, the hit target is taunted. May only proc once per combat on the same character. Cost fifteen thousand. Then we have Night Shield. Grants its user plus one bonus level in covert while equipped and allows the user to perform a covert check as a reaction to instantly covert themselves twice per hour. Costs 20,000. Can't imagine why. And then the Witch King's Helmet. The Skeleton Helmet grants its user plus one auto-hit die when attempting to resist mind-controlling effects. Fear and mental attacks. If you successfully resist one of these, once per round you may inflict 1d6 plus 2 ecliptic damage to your attacker. Costs, tw costs 12,000. Yep. Let's see, and then melee weapons. We have the carving axe, which is 1d6 plus 2 slashing damage. When throwing this axe at a target, you roll with plus 1 auto hit die on the attack. When dual wielding these axes, you inflict bleed after two attacks hit the same target. Cost 9,500. Then we have the her we have the harrowing blade, which does 1d6 slashing. When you successfully hit a target with less vitality than you, you may add plus four additional damage. Cost 7,000. That's a good that's a good bully weapon. Good weapon for anything that needs high vitality. Mm-hmm. And the Night Watch Mace, which inflicts 1d6 force damage. When attacking a target with heavy armor or higher, roll with plus one bonus die on your attack. If you critically hit a target wearing a shield, they lose their resistance for your next attack. Procs once per round, cost 8,000. I feel like this is a fuck you and your armor kind of weapon. I mean, it's a mace. All maces are fuck you and your armor. Mm -hmm. It's kind of why they were made. So next we have the Spiteful Stabber, which does 1d6 piercing damage. If you successfully <clears throat> hit a target with more current HP than you, you inflict plus 1d6 additional damage. This is a finesse weapon. Costs 7,500. That's a weapon for fighting bosses or bigger monsters.
Mm -hmm. And then we have the two-handed melee weapons. First is the Bitter Battle Axe. Does 2d6 plus 2 slashing. This battle axe is filled with bitter feelings. Once per round on a critical hit attack, you may reroll your critical result and damage die. If the rerolled damage die is a 1 result, then it automatically inflicts 3 damage. Costs 16,000. Let's see, then we have the Raven Feather Halberd, which does 2d6 slashing damage. This weapon has a range of 2 squares. Once per round, after you critically hit a target with this halberd, you may immediately perform an additional attack as an extra action that inflicts 1d6 plus 2 piercing damage. Costs 12,000. I think I like this more than the battle axe. And then we have the Scythe of Betrayal. Which does 3d6 slashing. This great scythe has a reach of two squares and inflicts damage on a two-square cone field. However, on a failed attack, you must perform an average three mentality check. On a failure, you leap to an ally within 12 squares range and attack them. On a critically failed attack, you automatically attack an ally and has the great tag, cost 18,000. Wow. Well, it's I'm not certain... sure I'd want to get it. It lives up to its name. I'll give it that. Yeah. Let's see. Then we have ranged weapons. And ranged weapons all have a clip that you in this list all have all use eclipse ammo. So first we have the fearful revolver. Deals 1d6 plus 2 damage, range is 2040, clip is 6. Once per round, if this inflicts damage on a target with the fear condition, roll on the critical chart minus one. Costs 6,500. Nice. See, then we have the fun sized sawed off. A fun sized sawed off. Wouldn't that just. Couldn't that just be a mare's leg? <laughs> yep. Uh. Does 1d6 plus 3 force damage in a 2-square cone. Clip has a clip of 4. This weapon pierces shields and throws a target off balance, giving them minus 1 bonus die on their next balance check. Cost 7,500. I'd say I like it, but you know how much of a sucker I am for shotguns. Indeed. Let's see, next is the Witch Hunt Gauntlets. Not to be confused with the Gauntlets of the Necromancer. Inflicts 1d6 piercing. Does fit range of 1530. Clip of 3. These Gauntlets may be fired as an extra action or action on your turn, even if you are dual-wielding weapons. Additionally, this inflicts pure damage against Corrupted, Arcanting, and Nightfall creatures. Costs 9,000. All I'm imagining is that these are Halloween rocket punches from Halloween Mazinger Z. Or, uh, by another name, Majin Kaiser Skull's turbo, turbo Pressure Punches. I can go with that. Uh, but then we have the two-handed ranged weapons. First is the oh, Eclipse man. Fall Longbow. Does 3d6 piercing damage, range is 3060, clip is 2. As an attack action, you may expend your two clip shots... To choose a 5x5 five five area field within this bow's short range. All creatures within all creatures in that field must perform a contested dodge balance check against your attack. On a failure, they take 5d6 ecliptic damage. After this attack, it takes one full round to reload the weapon, and this attack goes into a three round cooldown, costs 15,000. I meant Turbo Smasher Punch. I, I don't know why I mi mixed the Drill Pressure Punch with the Turbo Smasher Punch. Mm -hmm. Regardless. Yep. Let's see, next is the Grapple Rifle. Interesting. Does 2d6 force damage, range is 1530, has a clip of 10. Once per round, when, the, when this rifle hits a target successfully, you may activate its hard light grappling hook as an extra action. When done so... 
a grappling hook appears on your target and you may launch towards them. Any adversary you move by or away from may perform reactionary strikes against you if available. Costs 10,000. Mm-hmm. Why am I thinking of Kalina Ahn? I can't imagine why. Mm -hmm. Let's see, next is the Mana Ray Gun. <laughs> oh, fucking Ray Gun. 2d6 electrical damage. 10, 20 range. No clip. This unique Ray Gun has no clip. Instead, you may perform an average 3 arcanting check to reload it for free after 5 shots. The ray gun may use our canting or weapons master to attack. Costs eleven thousand. So, yeah, that's definitely a it's it's a magic gun. <laughs> um. Next is pumpkin lobber. No damage. Uh, range twenty forty and has a clip of four. This lobber consumes grenades as its clip and launches them as flaming pumpkin grenades. These grenades inflict the consumed grenades damage in a 5x5 five five area field. It takes a full round to reload with grenades. Costs 13,000. So should I make the green goblin joke or the hobgoblin joke? Uh, yes. Good answer. Let's see, then our new ammo, eclipse ammo. When a weapon use when a weapon that uses this ammo hits, roll two D six. On double one results, inflict the fear condition. On double six results, you are inflicted with fear. Costs two hundred per cost three hundred per clip. Let's see, then we have the Elder's Tome. Does what which is a ma which which now we're in magic weapons. This does one D six elemental, ranges twelve to twenty four. This hard light tome may be held either one or two handed. When wielded two handed, you are treated as having plus one bonus level in our canting. When held one handed, you may cast an additional spell as an extra action every six rounds. Costs seven thousand. Very nice. Although double double ca double casting is nice, but also but also remember charge states are a thing. Yeah, that's why you just do two different uh, two different areas or spells that don't increase your charge. Mm -hmm. Two different realms. Yep. But then, then we have Defender's Brew. As a reaction, you may perform a contested or canting check against an incoming melee attack. If you succeed, this potion's lid pops off and summons a liquid blade to deflect the incoming attack. On a critical success, the blade hits the attacker for 1d6 elemental damage. Costs 8,000. I just have this... This Im this image of instead of it being a potion, it's in a stein. Mm hmm And whenever somebody tries to attack the... Dr whenever somebody tries to attack the drinker, the blade pops out. Not finished with my drink now, am I? <laughs> See, next is Dreadfire Focus. Does 1d6 plus 2 fire damage. Range is 5x5. Five five. As an extra action once per round on your turn, you may unleash a blaze of dreaded dark fire in a 3x3 three three area field around you. All beings inside take damage listed and then must perform a contested arcanting or dodge or, or environmental survival check against your arcanting check. On a failure, they're inflicted with the burning condition. Um, range says 5x5, five five, effects is 3x3. Three three. Pick one. Yeah. Costs 8,000. Then we have five new items. First, the ghost arm. This is an augmentation. When attached to an augmented piece of armor, it grants the user a ghostly third arm. This arm can perform the rearm, unjam, reload action for the user for free. If the user is a mage, it may store one novice spell and cast it twice per day. Costs 15,000. Alright. Essentially, essentially an extra ghostly arm. Be an interesting mage visual. Hand. It's mage hand. Mm -hmm. Mage hand, except it's useful. Exactly. Then we have Healer's Bar. 
This small, candy-coated bar is infused with a simple mending medication. Upon eating, the user heals 1d6 plus 2 HP, costs 600. Then we have the Jack-O-Lantern. This item is a mechanized pumpkin with, that glows a calming yellow flame. While on a being, it acts as a shield against fear. When you are hit by the fear condition, the lamp shines bright, preventing the fear condition for one full round, three round cooldown. Costs 5,000. I get the feeling people in Nightfall are going to pick a jack-o'-lantern pretty quickly. Yeah. Let's see. Next is Deep Cauldron. This unique cauldron is crafted f for, I think, from a ferrite bar and formed into a crooked smile. Any potions crafted in this cauldron require 1d3 less ingredients, minimum 1. Additionally, roll with plus 1 auto-hit die as when crafting potions inside. Cost 7,500. And finally, the, ra the Wraith Chip. The Wraith Chip is a powerful hacking tool. The chip contains an advanced VI, and when used during a programming check, the user rolls with an auto-hit dice. Warning, has a slight chance of possessing the item hacked into. Roll 2d6, and on double ones, the unit becomes possessed with the VI. Has three uses, unless it possesses the item. Costs 6,000. Fun. <laughs> Imagine giving that to your hacker. I'd do it just to watch him scream when something got possessed. Yep. Oh. I'm a sadist. We know this. Mm -hmm. Now, a lot of the the lore and monsters things, I I want, I feel we should skip. I feel we should skip past. I mm -hmm. go straight to legendary artifacts. Yeah. Um. So first we have the candy bag, which is very rare. This is a simple white candy bag with a face of a ghost on it. This candy bag, however, can hold up to ten pounds of items. When food is placed inside, it transforms into candy pieces. The candy pieces, when eaten, will apply a random effect from the list below. If someone consumes more than two of these candies within a day, they would be knocked unconscious, grow, grow sick, and take 2d6 acidic damage. So either it's... So this is, this is the d6 results. Either sweet, heal 1d6 plus 2 HP. Sour, poison resistance for one hour. Powdered sugar stick plus two extra movement speed. Chocolate prevents madness for five minutes. Chewy caramel. You do not need to breathe. Lasts upwards of 15 minutes. And lollipop. Immune to burning for two minutes. All I got was a rock. <laughs> Ugh. Uh. And next we have Candy Corn Crystal, which is uncommon. These candy crystals are edible rock candies. They act as rations once per, day, once per day. They can be crafted into arcane vessels or decent weapons when a crafting check is used on them. When ground and added to potions, they give a sweet taste and add plus two stages of duration when the potion containing these crystals is drunk in nightfall. Uh. Although, I'm, I only ha I only ever had rock candy a, f a few rare times. I um wasn't a huge fan. Mm hmm. I don't rec. I don't recall what. I don't recall why, but I remember I remember just not being just not being a fan of it. Yeah. But next is Cloak of Mizera. This item is a long flowing cloak that mimics Mizera's cloaked appearance. It flows behind its wear and gives the gives them the ability to hover slightly above the ground. When the cloak is worn, roll with plus one auto hit die and covert checks. 
When the hood is up, the wearer gains plus one auto hit die and intimidation checks. Hey, it's a, hey, it's a cloak that uh, that some of our friends can use to feel taller. <laughs> uh, then we have fun sized pistol. This is a small Derringer pistol with the symbol of change etched onto the hilt. The pistol oh may be fired as an extra action. It has an 8 square range and inflicts 2d6 damage. The pistol uses no ammo and has a 6 caliber clip that refreshes twice per day after eating a large meal. That's a interest that's an interesting way to reach to refill your ammo on that kind of thing. Yep. Then again, it is a Derringer, so the fact that you can fire it more than once is a miracle. That too. Is maybe there's some rare exception that that is in the, that is something that Ian would cover, but I don't recall Derring I don't recall Derringers having more than single shot. Usually they're two shot. Two shot Derringers were the most common types of Derringers uh, carried. Mm hmm. I don't know why I kept thinking it was one shot. I think it's I think it's because of the two of the stacked barrels. Yeah. Uh let's see, next is Grimace. This handheld shield is crafted from the hard bark found in the Spiller forests. Unlike the towering trees there, this bark is charred. When not in use, it has the appearance of a burnt shield. When activated as an action, it lasts for ten minutes. While active, a burning, grimacing smile appears and grants its wielder plus one bonus level in Intimidation. While this is active, you gain immunity to fire damage for the eh, typo, and gain access to the novice level arcane fire spells. This may be activated three times per day. While inactive, it acts as a normal shield. I like that. <laughs> Indeed. Then we have the hourglass. Wonder if it works like the wonder if it works like the stopwatch. Hey. This is a small hourglass with glowing green sand that flows through it. If this hourglass is broken as an extra action, it grants its user an extra reroll on their next check. Okay, I figured it would cast stop, but instead it casts haste. <laughs> So ne next is Mask of Repel. These spooky masks are designed to scare off any unwanted creatures from the realm of Nightfall. These masks all are relatively useless aside from providing some comfort to mortals during the hours of Nightfall. Um, you can probably buy them from the Happy Mask Salesman. Pretty much. Uh, let's see, then we have Mist of Nightfall. This is a small leather pouch with the face of a carved pumpkin missing an eye with a smile that wraps up toward the stem. Inside is a small pile of luminescent dust. When thrown, this dust expands into a misty 3x3 three three area field. All beings within this field are blinded for one round. Nice. Is it pocket sand? Pocket sand! <laughs> See, then we have Treat. Treat is a curved five-point dagger carved of a silver black metal with a leather-wrapped handle with the word Treat etched onto the blade. A fi fine-point dagger, not five-point. This dagger inflicts 2d6 slashing damage. Once per round on an attack with this dagger, you may reroll a single one result. Oop. Three times per day, you may eat the blade of this dagger and heal for 1d6 plus 4 HP. If paired with trick, you gain an additional attack as an extra action. Uh, just You eat the blade. It's a treat. What do you expect? Mm -hmm. 
Then we have trick. Trick is a curved five point. Again, I did. I did it again. Fine point dagger. I feel like I've. I feel like I've. I haven't watched Crawl in years, and why do I keep thinking about that? I don't know. Why do you? Carved of a silver black metal with a leather wrapped handle with the word trick etched into the blade. This dagger inflicts 2d6 slashing damage. Your attacks with this blade roll with plus one bonus die. Three times per day is an extra action after a successful hit. You may teleport an allied target within 12 squares of you. If paired with... Or you can teleport to an allied target. If paired with treat, you gain an additional act, attack as an extra action. Gives a new definition to trick or treat! Mm-hmm. And that covers ev covers everything that I've got everything that I've got in regard to no, in regard to Veil of the Void. So as far as as far as our thoughts I find Veil of the Void to be extremely interesting in how it handles customization. And this is something I want to see people hack. Absolutely. Oh, absolutely. I'd say the only the only real issue I can see happening is managing cooldown. Managing multiple cooldowns. Yeah. I can see what you're saying. I mean, while there's while um it's made somewhat easier with the spell cards because because you have the you have a cooldown tracker on them. I do think a additional part of the character sheet that that can track cooldowns is is a would be a good suggestion. Yeah, that sort of addition because not everybody's going to have the spell cards would be vital. Yeah. Um if you're doing if you're doing this on a phys, if you're doing this on a physical table, you um Use more d sixes. If it were me, I'd probably um, I'd use a single sheet of paper with each um, the name of each spell that has a cooldown on it, and then from there, right one through right one through six. I know. Uh, from there, I'd put a die next to each one. That's how I'd track it. Ah. Yeah, that's that's really the that's really the only issue. And granted, this sort of cooldown tracking isn't as egregious as say the um, cooldown tracking I had to put up with in uh, Warhammer Third Edition. I don't <laughs> hate Warhammer Third Edition like some people, but some but tracking cooldown was a bit atrocious, especially when you're on a virtual tabletop. It's a bit of a bitch. Yep. And. I think that I do apl I do applaud the fact that it's able that this was able to handle 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 um a lot of a lot of the stuff that I was critical of something like Traveler for stuffing too much into one book. We don't really have mm -hmm. that problem here. No, we don't. Um it's just the right balance in fact. Mm -hmm. Uh I d I will I will admit that some that some some parts of equipment could have could probably used a little bit of expansion, but it's not a deal breaker. And up until recently, one of the big things I was going to bitch about was the lack was the lack of proper bookmarks. Yeah, but he did update that too. Mm -hmm. So there go so there goes that line. He uh he stopped your train at the pass. Which I'm perfectly fine with because if because better navigation means less headaches. Less headaches, ostensibly. <laughs> your your players can always bring more headaches. Don't forget that, monk. Mm -hmm. But um, the greatest interest I have here with uh, Veil of the Void is exactly how much customization can. Uh, create a sense of a character that's actually yours. A character that actually feels unique to you and only you. Because of 
how many permutations are available. Uh, and also the the as we've discussed about the uh, customization in the past, the the ability to mix mix and match non exclusive class features, mix and match non exclusive spells, um, really easy to gish everything, really easy to make your ideal. Well, I didn't really like that skill, so I'm going to swap it out for this other one. Um, you know, that's that's something that you don't normally have in most games. Mm-hmm. And so, it's really a, a, a large scale boon to the entire process of making a character that's, you know, you're in a galaxy, you're in a huge space. People with these types of jobs are going to be everywhere, and to stand out, to be something more than just another face in the crowd of of people, you're going to need this type of customization. So I feel that really, the granularity of customization lends itself to the fact that the place you are in is larger than you know larger than life in many ways Mm -hmm. Uh, i like the idea that there's a void area somewhere between like it feels like kind of like the warp to me but kind of not um and i also like the fact that there that the realms in which magic come from are places you could ostensibly go to if you weren't worried about fucking dying to the energy there uh I absolutely love the fact that ship combat is a team effort. Oh yeah, that was... we've seen plenty of times where ship combat is um is what is one man doing all the heavy lifting. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever the pilot might be. But now you've got, you know, everybody does something and all the roles are done on your on your ship's initiative turn and then things are executed. Mm-hmm. And it's, it is, um, one of the most in-depth and interesting vehicle-based combats I've seen, especially again at the starship level. Yeah, um, I really love it a lot. I'd say, st- I'd say stand, I'd say standard vehicle combat could you could use a little bit of an of an expansion. By that I mean on gr- on ground vehicle combat. Yeah. I mean, I imagine that if you're in a multi-person ground vehicle that has windows or an open roof, you could have ranged characters pop up and do the thing you always do. And then, of course, whoever's piloting does the piloting checks, etc. Yeah. Maybe you have a mechanic in there who's fixing things on the fly while you're inside. Mm-hmm. That'd be kind of cool. Um, what is really going to make or break things is how the is how this game handles... Or how would how would GM handles um, reward payouts? Because a lot of the equipment doesn't come cheap. Yeah, most of the equipment's pretty expensive. Now, granted, you start out with several thousand um, credits, yeah. cre- credits right out right out of the gate. But and this is this is one of those things where no designer is going to be able to fix this because it's a it's very mu- it's very much it's very much a um a gm kind of thing yeah and and not to mention the fact that there's likely a um a reason that most of those more advanced weapons and such are are uh, expensive as you might be intended to get them much later in your career, like at mm-hmm. level ten up. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's. I don't think that a game like this would have the drop off problem that I've cr- that I've criticized um, certain uh, certain more ubiquitous games of having. The world's most ubiquitous game. Yes. <laughs> In fact, I am I am I am working on a script to discuss the high level drop off. Yeah, yeah, that does need to be addressed because it's stupid. Well, it also it also needs to be addressed because I got a bunch of people telling me that there's that there's nothing that I'm being too negative about it. Even if that were true. Fuck you. That's all I have to say to those people. Even if that were true, fuck you. Because 
Well, th those are the same. Pe those are the same people who think criticism makes you a hater. So yeah. Ah, toxic positivity. Mm-hmm. I mean, I can criticize something and still love it. We did, in fact, criticize small things here and there in both Heavens and Heresies and here in Veil of the Void, um, simply because we f feel that we want this person, this person, these designers to succeed, and we want them to make the best, the best vision of their product that they can. And if any criticism we can give can assist in that endeavor, we're going to give it. Mm -hmm. And... Well, I I know that now this is certainly if I were to put the if I were to put this in my score in my scoring system, Veil of the Void would almost would certainly be a strongly recommended. Strongly recommended, yeah. I know. <laughs> People might be now accusing us of well, why don't you review bad stuff? Uh, we have a a different series for that. It's it's called the Parliament of Geeks. And even and, then, we don't really want to. We don't want to do that. <laughs> I do not want to put other. Pe I'm perfectly fine with reviewing a bet with reviewing a bad game by myself. However, however, putting subjecting other people to that level of bad and the mental pain that comes with it is not something I'm 100% comfortable with doing, and I've. Made that clear to the others. Yep. We don't like giving people an experience full of shit that we know is going to be full of shit. If if it's unknown, we go in with, you know, some enthusiasm and come out the other side with disappointment, a la the Power Rangers RPG. <laughs> uh, that's one thing. We, we, you know, there was some tentative optimism there, and it was betrayed. But let's say someone says, "Well, why, why don't you guys do a veil or do a Valley of the Judge on uh, on rifts, Monk?" I, I, I'll leave that response to you. First off, fuck no, I'm not go. I am not going. I have done my time. I'm not going back to the Palladium system. <laughs> Second off, no matter which one, no matter which one we do, whether it be the original Palladium version or the Savage Worlds version, there wouldn't be a whole lot for me to say. Either a, either a, we're covering something that has been well tread to death for decades, and everybody, and you, and you either already like riffs, or, i.e., you're an, i.e., you're an apologist. Or you use it as a whipping boy, like I do. I've already made, I've already made clear for years on this channel that Riffs is one of my whipping boys. Indeed. So I don't, I don't see the point in covering something like Riffs because, uh, because it's not tre it's treading old ground. Indeed, and even if it were new, though, we know its quality is piss poor. We know Rifts had a good idea that was executed terribly. And, uh, and you know, that's mainly due to Mr. Stick-Up-His-Ass himself wanting to micromanage everything. Mm -hmm. um, one of these days I will do a dramatic reading of the Bill Coffin story. <laughs> but today is not that day. Indeed. Now, the uh, the other thing the other thing is the goal of the the there are certain there are plenty of accentuate the bad kind of reviewers and internet personalities you know the kind of the kind of person who will t who will tell you how a certain thing sucks and ex and expose the wor and expose the worst of a given medium I am not that personality. My goal has been to ex my goal from day one has been to expand the hobby to show awesome things that people that I feel people are overlooking, and given how the and given how the tabletop hobby is in an unhealthy state where it where it's one or two games at one or two games at the top and everybody and everybody else is struggling to get noticed, 
I've got a lot of I've got a lot of ground to work with. I'm not hurting for choice. Yep. And when I th and I have very high standards when it comes to what I consider bad games. I'd also like to uh to note to anyone else who might be uh wondering, well, if you never review bad games then where's the contrast? Uh it's not that we don't review bad games. It's that we don't go out of our way looking for bad games. I'll I'll note that the Valley of the Judged concerning Level Up 5e, we went in with some tentative optimism because it seemed like this was an attempt to really change 5e for the better. And the optimism fell off because of the fact that they betrayed that optimism by getting lazy halfway through, maybe, or just deciding to listen to only a small vocal minority saying, you don't need all this stupid narrative shit here, just have this. Which was part of the undoing of Level Up 5e. We, we will hit games that maybe we go in thinking, this is going to be cool, and then we find a lot more things to criticize than we thought. Mm-hmm. Today is not one of those, though. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing to keep in mind is that I don't is that I don't use a numeric score. Yep. Because I find I find numeric scores to create more problems than they're worth. And the, they tend to be used as as a, they tend to be used as erroneously as an object as an objective measure of value when they're not. Mm-hmm. Well, for me, there's the issue of what of what separates a five from a six, if you're using the ten point metric. A little too granular. Where's where's the where's the barrier? A little too granular and muddled. Yeah, at least yeah. with the tier system, you there's a clear difference between something that's recommended and strongly recommended. Recommended and strongly recommended, or you know, avoid. <laughs> mm -hmm. Uh, and I know somebody might bring up how the Power Rangers RPG, but the thing about that was, if I hadn't got the P if I hadn't gotten the PDF sent to me, I probably wouldn't have covered it. I would. It was sent. It was sent to me because I was curious to see how bad it actually was. Because another person in the monastery brought it to our attention that it was bad. Mm -hmm. And. That's that's something we tend to, you know, bad stuff tends to get ranted and reconstructed on Geekwatch. So there's that too. We'll talk about the bad and we'll even castigate some of the bad decisions rather vehemently. Um and then we'll go and here's how we can do it better because that's the other part of expanding the hobby. Mhm. Mm that there's going to be bad shit, and you're going to see it, and you're going to go, this is fucking terrible. And then you're going to go, but you could change these things, and now it's better. Mm -hmm. That gives people idea for homebrews and hacks. That gives uh, actual developers ideas for retweaking or revamping their games if necessary. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind... There, next week there will be a bit of there will be a couple of one shots, but not because that was the initial, not because that's what I had planned. See, ne the plan that I had was was next week we would do the champions quick start, mm -hmm. and I um I know some might some might say champions is a big damn name. Do you really need to do? Do you really need to highlight a quick start of ch of champions? Given how Champions and Hero System has a reputation of being a bit impenetrable, yeah, I think I do. However, this morning, as I record this, I ended up get I ended up getting something something put forward to my attention that made me realize that we need to call an audible. It also made him dance with glee and saying "fuck you, I told you so" about seven times. Yeah. And you'll see, you'll see what that you'll 
If you're on the server, you can probably figure out what that audible is. But you will. But we will be recording that on Wednesday, and you'll probably see that Wednesday night. Um, but next Friday we will be doing um, the Champions Quick Start. Mm -hmm. And then after the, and starting in June. All of all of June will be will be the Fridays of June. We will be covering the playtest documents for Magi Knights. I'm looking forward to that one, honestly. Mm -hmm. Especially especially after uh, attending the Q and A with the developers. Yeah, they're good. They're good folk. And anybody who can laugh at my jokes can't be all bad. I hope they can handle a review full of swearing, though, because it's gonna happen. Oh, I I think I've already I think I've already told them that we that we get a little chaotic. <laughs> I think I told them that when I said I was chaos incarnate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is a story for another day. So until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.